First Rick Fit Live podcast, Zurich, Switzerland. Born in Miami, lives in Zurich now. Models in the building. Welcome to the first Rick Fit podcast. I've been doing this online for a while, but as many of you know, I love deep conversations, especially with good friends. So whenever we travel, we're going to try to do as many live podcasts as possible. Today, our first guest, Giuseppe Gentile. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for taking the time. Really, really glad to have you and have this combo. So yeah. Just, um, you know, we've had you on the podcast before. I think it was episode 50 about two and a half years ago. Uh, so I'd, I'd love to touch upon your journey as a player, as well as transitioning into an agent. I want to cover some topics, you know, especially comparing the U.S. to European football. I want to give these guys and girls some tips from you as a pro player, as well as an agent. So, yeah, just start us off. I mean, we're sponsored by Pellegrino. I know you're... Uh, you got some nice black coffee in you. You got some Pellegrino, some minerals. You're ready to go. So that's right. You just introduce yourself to the audience, yeah. brother. All right, guys. My name is Giuseppe Gentile. I'm a Swiss American ex-professional football player and transitioned into becoming a professional soccer agent or football agent. And um, started my journey uh, about two, two and a half years ago um, with uh, my business partner Dennis Chin, which was a former uh, teammate of mine. And I definitely saw him as a, as a big brother, uh, someone who really just uh, taught me the ropes, you know. He, um, he definitely uh, helped me along my journey as a footballer when we met in, in Orlando. And um, he, was, uh, he was a big time player when, when I was coming in. And uh, he, he really took me under his wing. And um, as, a, as a younger player, I was only 21 and he was a veteran guy, golden boot winner. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of respect, had a big name, and um, yeah, I, I felt that connection early on. And um, we actually even played together again in Ottawa Fury a few years later, and um, we shared the same agent. And it was, it was kind of destined uh, that we, we would uh, connect uh, post-career, that once we both retired, that we would start working together. Uh, it was kind of predestined, and it made a lot of sense, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like a little bit of a background of how uh, the partnership started with our agency and um, it's been going uh, about two years now and we've been working with you obviously for the past year and a half it's been a, it's been a big pleasure and uh, yeah man it's just uh, it's been a lot of fun yeah and uh, learning a lot for sure yeah so you know um, just want to get in first how we met uh, you know the connection uh, me meeting Dennis, me meeting you for the first time, and then I want to go deeper into your career, how you sure. started playing the game, you know, your youth career. Sure. So yeah, if you could just, you know, let the audience ha ha uh, know how you discovered me, you know, kind of your first impression on Instagram, and then your first impression in person, you know, what was the difference, and yeah. what, what did you what did you see in me, because, you know, obviously, you know, you saw me as a player, right. uh, and obviously for, you know, the, the audience listening, you want to look um you know professional on and off the pitch as a player yeah. so yeah if you could just go into it and, and let them know uh, yeah. maybe they can take some influence sure yeah no i mean of course um i think uh, something that makes a player very special is a, is a player that's willing to take on a challenge i think that players that are willing to move uh out of their comfort zone and move into different territories different countries um you know it's it's, it's, it's a character thing right yep. it, 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 it shows you um that this, this player is willing to do pretty much anything to get to get to their goals. And uh, you know, that's definitely something that stuck out about you as a player, that you, you have many destinations and, and, and that you never gave up, right? So at the time, I believe you, you were in Israel, you were playing Israel professionally, but um, you had destinations in, like, uh, in Sweden, I believe, and in Germany previously, which obviously shows that like, you, know, you weren't afraid to leave the American market uh out of college and um you know i think that that's definitely something that is very 
uh, desirable from a characteristic standpoint from a footballer. It yeah. has absolutely nothing to do with uh, talent. This has only to do with personality and characteristics. And I think that um, that's fundamental to a footballer. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. is their is their personality. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, you know, obviously, you you being able to adapt internationally uh, was definitely the first point that was uh, attractive. And then, of course. You, you were building and, and growing in your development of your of your brand RickFit and um, I saw that as a huge opportunity to to work together with someone who knows you know the the, the tech savvy the the online presence yeah. someone who knows how to manage not only just their time but also like be disciplined in their in their craft and just perfecting their craft daily and I guess Specifically, if I had to narrow it down to what was really interesting, is of course you as a person is 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 your 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 determination kind of, and you're you're always persistent and uh, consistent. You know, those are things that are fundamental, not just for any footballer, but just for people in general. Like this has nothing to do with sports. This just has to be, or this has to do with who you should strive to be as a person. And I think that you have many great qualities that young aspiring professionals, you know, current professionals, and obviously also people outside of football uh, have. And, and that's what really made you as attractive to myself, which obviously I made a known, really well known and very easily uh, see, like to see to the eye uh, to Dennis and, yeah. and that's what made us decide to really work with you yeah was yeah. your was your character and yeah. and just your work ethic mm -hmm. uh, no dude you know uh, I don't want to make this podcast all about me but I appreciate it I think it's very helpful for the audience to see what an agent sees from the outside yeah you know and how they perceive a player so I appreciate you sharing that and just to add on to that before we move on to the next topic you know many of you guys and girls know know that you know I'm still a player in Latvia but I've taken over as in the director role and one thing that I've been talking a lot about to the coach lately is you know when we want to bring players in we want to have our own mold of players mm -hmm. and one of the most important things like you said is, is that mindset of constant self growth constant self improvement because like you said you know the most important characteristics I believe of a player obviously you need the talent to play at the level but to stay at the level and continue improving you need to have that hunger to grow and learn and, and I think uh, like you said not just for a football or for any person yeah. it makes you attractive to any person um, so whether you're looking for a friend or whether you're looking for, for a partner uh, whether you're looking for a footballer that stuff is, is, is very important so um, yeah just just for the people listening you know the coach pointed out something very interesting to me that I want to share with you is you know, when he was working in Germany at uh, his club in, in the fourth tier, the Regionalliga, they're looking to go up to the third league. So, Greisfeld, they actually have a lot of ambitions. He said that the sports director always wants to talk to at least three or four other people that have dealt with the player and not just uh, the other coaches, you know, kit men, teammates, to mm. see how the player treats mm. other people on and off the field. And I think. You know the, the attitude and, and the character is so big in football. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think you made some good points. Like you know, I think uh, you need to treat the president of the club the exact same way as you would have to treat the kid man, or you know, yeah. treat the trainer, or treat the not just your your veteran teammates, but your yeah. your rookie teammates. Yeah. And um, that's those are all tangible things. Yeah. Those are all. Things that you can attain and, and work on and, 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 and you have control over those things. Yeah. So um, in football, uh, theoretically speaking and, and practically speaking, um, you, to, you need to really work on yourself as a person. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, that will take you a really long way. It'll exactly. take you very far. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Just like we were talking with before the podcast with, uh, you know, my young one-on-one -on -one client that we have, you know, in, in Latvia brought him here to Switzerland for, for three months. Yeah. You know, football, is, it's a, it's a self-improvement journey in itself, you know, and that, that's what makes it so special, yeah. you know, uh, through the discipline that, you know, you've instilled throughout your professional career, taking it into your agency career. You know, you learn that all through, through football. Yeah. So, you know, with that being said, can, can you take us back to the roots, you know, when you started playing the game, 
uh, where you played, you know, your youth football, college, and then into yeah. your first pro contract. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, for for the viewers uh, listening, we're we're actually currently in my in my country. We're currently in Switzerland. So Rick uh, made all his way over here to to come see me. So I really appreciate that. It's uh, you know this is what makes uh, you know relationships so special, and, and not just in life but in football that you know people from all walks of life, people from from different backgrounds. You know, you always meet up, and uh, that's something that definitely uh, uh, makes just our beautiful game so special. You know, and uh, just you know work on those relationships, groom them, and uh, things like this will happen. You know, like people people doing cool things together. So I appreciate that for you uh, being here in Zurich. Uh, so to the question, or I guess to my journey, so I obviously started playing uh, youth football here in a very, very small town. It's called FC Tusis Katsis, very, very small club. The town uh, is about um, 2,000 uh, in population, so very humble beginnings and uh, very small. Uh, so I just, you know, for fun when I was five, I, um, yeah, when I was five. Uh, I, I actually started first playing hockey when I was four mm -hmm. and I wasn't that big of a fan so I stopped um, and I started playing football when I was uh, five and yeah I just immediately fell in love with running around chasing a ball you know kicking a ball was, uh, kicking people <laughs> I can't yeah, be honest yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. being honest right yeah. um, uh, so yeah, you know, I immediately fell in love with that. Uh, it gave me, I guess, the balance uh, between, you know, having to sit down in school all day and having to learn and do your homework and, you know, do all that stuff. And that obviously that came later on in life. But I mean, um, just, you know, falling in love with the activity was, was very evident mm -hmm. very early on. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it gave me that um, equilibrium, gave me that balance in my mm -hmm. life uh, between schoolwork, like friends, family. I could just pick up a ball, I could go to any field and just, you know, practice yep. and, and hone in my craft. So um, after that, I just, you know, made my way through the youth ranks there and um, I ended up getting selected for a select team in the region uh, in Switzerland, in the southeast part of the, of the country. And it was, was a U12 category and I played in those, in those categories for three years until the under 15s. Uh, after that, I made my way to the under 16s of Liechtenstein, which is a separate country, but they have a select team as well. Um, so I was playing there. Um, I was always regarded as a really, really, really good player, just never had the size. Mm -hmm. I was a very, very late bloomer. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't grow until I was 18. Okay. So to my full size, mm -hmm. like I was about, when I was 15, I was probably about in centimeters, I was about 165, um, and like probably plus minus 50 kilos, yeah, yeah, 55 yeah, kilos. Yeah, like I was yeah, a twig. Yeah, I was yeah. really, really small, but yeah. extremely fast. Yeah. Um, I, I was a very, very hard worker. Yeah. Um, and my best trait was finishing. I was just a, mm. I was really clinical front goal. Um, but the reason was, was my separation speed. I would always run behind the back four and mm. I would just separate myself from the back four mm. and then I would be able to finish. So mm -hmm. uh, that's what really uh, propelled me in my youth career. Um, so yeah, then I, I kind of hit a fork in the road. Um, it was time to decide if I wanted to uh, progress my career uh, academically also yeah. uh, in the United States or in Switzerland. Yeah. And um, yeah. in Switzerland, how the system works, when you're 15, you're done with your like regular education mm -hmm. and then you go mm -hmm. on and you start an apprenticeship mm -hmm. and then you continue your education uh, while you're learning a new skill. Which is good, I think. Right. The apprenticeship is you're doing, you're, you're getting educated in your skill, yeah. like in your yeah. job. Yeah. Yeah. So very, uh, like very specialized hands on yeah. yeah hands on and specialized exactly so you're you're doing the the day to day hands on work while you're studying the theoretical uh side by side yeah. so um i was 15 i didn't know what i wanted to do so um i ended up deciding not to get to go to the united states mm -hmm. so my grandmother had moved from miami florida to charlotte north carolina mm -hmm. and um i ended up moving in with her and um I ended up going to Ardrico High School in Charlotte, North Carolina, okay. Okay. and um, I really, I really loved it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I guess to mention before 
I went over to the States. I had a trial with FC St. Gallen okay. with the under 18s and um, it, w- it was a it was a fair evaluation, I'd say. Mm-hmm. I mean, they evaluated me basically saying that I, my skill sets were good enough to be yeah. Yeah. on the team, but yeah. they already had basically players that mm-hmm. already possessed what they were looking for yeah. in my yeah. position. Yeah. So they basically said, look, like we could, we could take you, but it just wouldn't probably be the smartest choice for yourself because for one, we already have these players in these positions, yeah. and for two, uh, you live an hour and a half, an hour and 15 away, so it would be tough to you know commute uh just for a little playing time mm-hmm. and then you know that bit pretty much made my my uh, decision clear to go to the states so i think that was important to mm-hmm. to note as well yeah um i just i don't want to cut you off sure. but uh, you had a good you know you you were talking about and i think you know it's, it's surprising in switzerland what, what i want to touch on a little bit but uh in the states i mean i think it's 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 growing now since the game is going growing and more european talent uh from players and coaches is coming in, uh, but you talked about you know that you didn't have the size. Right. So you know, f- for listeners watching, just to give them some practical advice, you know, if you don't have the size and you are a late bloomer, okay. w- what what kind of advice would you give them uh, to to work on? What type of things would you tell them to hone in on? Because like we talked about from the very beginning of the conversation, you can only control what you can control, yeah. and you can't control your height. Yeah, you can exactly. control your weight, but right. in terms of height, you know, you can't really control it. So, yeah. what, what would your advice be, you know, to, to work on um, if you don't have the size? Yeah, I mean, look, like, I mean, this is quite evident, one of the best footballers of all time, uh, Messi. Obviously, he had uh, a lot of problems with, with his, uh, I guess, physical development, yeah. and, he, and he was on steroids, several medicines, and, and different types of therapies in order to actually grow to a decent size. So... I mean, look, he was, you could already tell, like, for whomever's, I guess, a, a messy follower, someone even who, who's not even just an admirer, someone that all just follows football in general knows that the, the talent was always there. Yeah. He was, from the, from the time he touched the football, he was, he was that player. Yeah. Yeah. It's just he didn't have that physical tool to, I guess, kind of excel in, uh, in the sport. But yeah. yeah. In reality, I mean, look what he's done. I mean, it's like, I mean, it just rest speaks for itself. So, yeah. I mean, in reality, I mean, I wouldn't want to tell anybody to, you know, oh, hey, like, you know, go to the gym and get strong or whatever, mm-hmm. get faster, mm-hmm. you know. Those are all things that you should be focused on anyways. Yeah. 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 Like, and I don't think that's something that you should specifically do if you don't think that you're going to grow. So, for my personal self, I didn't know during the, that time that I would ever grow. So, I just thought that I was just going to be either around this size and basically what happened for me was that, you know, I, I just kept getting better. Like, I just kept perfecting what I was good at. Like, I was just, I was just always busy. Like, I never was the type of player that was, you know, kind of thinking with my brain as much in the sense that I wasn't thinking as much tactically. I was just thinking more, you know, well, see, this is kind of a statement I need to be careful with. Of course I was thinking tactically yeah, because yeah. I was thinking of where I need to run, where the space is, identifying where I need to penetrate mm-hmm. and the right times, mm-hmm. make those runs on the channels or make yeah. the runs but like a, a diagonal run behind the back four. So of course it's 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 tactical of course. Yeah. But more from a physical standpoint, yeah. I was thinking more of like I need to stay busy because I can't let these big guys get a yeah. hold of me and grab me and, and you know bully me. Yeah. So I need to stay busy. So Basically, um, my advice would just really be like for all the young footballers and aspiring pros, just you know keep better, keep keep getting better at what you're good at, and you know um, obviously you can work on your weaknesses, but like for example, specifically height, like like you emphasize, like that's not something that you can control. That's just your your biological uh, development will determine how tall you are. Um, I don't think that it's always the smartest thing to just go hit the gym and just become swollen and really strong and this and that. Like sometimes uh, you are probably a little bit better if you're maybe a little bit lighter on your feet, you're a little bit more dynamic, a little more agile. Um, but in reality, I think that, um, yeah, just really perfect what you're good at. Like for me, it was finishing. Like I mean, yeah. for me, what I was doing really, I was just, I was getting the ball in around the six and around the 18. Um, I, and I was just shooting. I mean, I was yeah. taking yeah. shots yeah. from inside the six. I was yeah. taking yeah. shots across the body. I was taking shots left-footed. I was taking, you know, 
you know, back to goal, like, yeah. you know, outside of the wrists, you know, finish. I was doing all that yeah, yeah, because that's yeah. what I could control. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I was good at. Yeah. And um, while I was in college, that's really where I excelled. And that's really where that next level hit because I, I grew. Mm -hmm. So all of that work that I put in before manifested during that time period that once I grew, I took my game to the next level. And now that doesn't mean that everyone will grow. But if you are a late bloomer, um, just don't focus on your height. There are so many aspects of the game that you can work on. Because like I just stated at the beginning of this, it's like, look at Messi. Like if he would have focused on his physical self, he would have never been who he is. He mm -hmm. focused on his special ability and intellect and just perfected that. And of course, being in an environment where he was with Barcelona with having top of the line coaches, top of the line teammates, his his uh, tools just became sharper and sharper yeah. and sharper yeah. um, and didn't let his size get in the way. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, for all, I guess, to, to abbreviate all the kids that um, are, are having, I guess, problems or I guess kind of like, you know, insecurities about their size, don't let that stop you. Really just focus on on the things that you can control. And if you're, if, for example, if you're fast, that, that, that's an amazing tool. Speed is really important in today's game. Yep. So if you're small and agile and your acceleration is there and you got the first three to four yards on a center back that's six foot three, that's a really, a really, really important aspect of the game. Mm -hmm. Separation speed. Um, that's, that's everything. That's what creates chances. That's right. That's right. Exactly. That's what creates chances is that millisecond, half a second, one second difference between you know, getting to the ball first. And um, yeah, if you're, for example, if you're fast, focus on the tactical aspect. Focus on where's the space? Where do I run? How do I run? The timing with my teammates. Uh, study the game. That's really my best advice if you're fast because you don't want to be a train track player. Uh, you don't want to be a fullback or a winger or a center forward, center striker or something. And just be very predictable. Because if you're doing a monotonous, like very monotone uh, rhythm and, and you know, it, you become predictable and very easy defendable. So if you're constantly busy, you're constantly looking for the space in behind, you're constantly looking for the space in front. Center backs and center midfielders, they, they just hate yeah. having to leave their position and expose yeah. any type of space. Yeah. So yeah, just really pick out a player that you think you are similar to and try to replicate that as well. I think that's a good mm -hmm. tip that, mm -hmm. that could help a young player. Mm -hmm. um, that, that definitely would, would, they could identify in that role. Like, they could identify in, hey, like for example, wingers traditionally, like in the modern game, like left or right wingers, dependent on the, what style, if they're inverted winger, meaning that if you're a left winger, you're right footed and you cut inside, when you, you shoot with your right, or if you're an inverted left winger and you're a left footer, or sorry, right winger, and you're inverted and you come into your left, shoot with your left. There's great examples at the top level of these players. Like for example, Robin was probably one of the best, yeah. uh, you know, Dutch, not just Dutch players, but just yeah. players of all time yeah. better to do that inverted winger role. And his counter partner, uh, Ribéry on the other side, I mean, they were unstoppable. Yeah. I mean, you knew what they were gonna do. I mean, they were, and, and, and their size was, they were they were normal, normal size. They were in between 170, 175 or something like that. Like not not tall. They weren't in the one meter 80s. Mm -hmm. They weren't in six foot taller. Mm -hmm. They were just in and around that average size. And uh, they just perfected that, right? They, they, they just, uh, you know, they were amazing. Amazing yeah, to yeah, watch. Yeah. So yeah, I'd say definitely study study a player yeah and yeah yeah just really tactically that's where you can get your advantage mm. yeah i love that i mean some really great points i mean number one you know focusing on your strengths i i, I think that's huge because you know like you said you know there are i think there are many different types of players in the game and you you know obviously you want to emulate certain players mm -hmm. you know and uh in your position but they might have different strengths than you. So Absolutely. like you said, to combine both of those, find a player that you want to play like, that kind of plays similar to you. And then I, you know, I think 
I always talk about it to players, clients, you know, mm -hmm. uh, people on social media. I think one of the most underrated skills for a footballer is true self-analysis. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's very tough. I think true self-accountability, looking yourself in the mirror mm -hmm. and telling yourself what you're good at and what you're bad at is huge because, mm -hmm. you know, obviously in, in the modern game, you know, the goal, like you said, is obviously you need to be of the level, you know, whether you're trying to play college, whether you're trying to play on your A team, or whether you're trying to play professionally. Mm -hmm. But once you're at that level and you have that base and that foundation, you got to just hammer on those strengths. Yeah. And, and like you said from the very beginning, it was your separation speed that really differentiated you. And, you know, like you said, you worked on all those other aspects. And then when you really had that growth spurt in college, everything mm -hmm. exponentially came together. So yeah, I mean, I, I think those are some, some great insights and uh, yeah, I appreciate you sharing. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so, so let's uh, head back to, you know, you said you moved in with your grandma in North Carolina, went yeah. to high school. Yeah. What was the next step after that? Yeah, so um, I, I obviously grabbed the attention very early of um, the North Carolina soccer scene. I was, uh, you know, selected for multiple All-State teams and um, when I was a sophomore in high school, sorry. I immediately just you know took off and and basically was a, a standout player, and um, I joined this academy called CSA, mm -hmm. which is called uh, Charlotte Soccer Academy, and uh, um, the under 16s coach was uh, Jeremy Gunn, which uh, he uh, is currently the Stanford um, University uh, soccer college coach. And he won three national championships in a row with Stanford. He did, did a really good job there. Um, produced a lot of great players, currently playing in MLS, even some in Europe. Um, some representing the US men's national team. So very, very, very competent and good coach. Um, scouted me early. He scouted me from the under 18s because I was playing three years up. So I was playing at 15, I was playing with the under 18s. But he was this under 16s coach from the academy and he was also simultaneously, he was also the head coach of the UNC Charlotte soccer program, mm -hmm. uh, which was in division one. So at 15, he already had an eye on me and he, and he really was keen on, on, on my skill sets. And like I said, I, I still had a lot of time to grow until I was 18 to go to college. And uh, he was just always a close, close follower mm -hmm. of, of my progression. And um, it ended up turning out to be that um, yeah, he, he immediately said from when I was 15, he wanted me to come to UNC Charlotte. Um, and it was never communicated officially, but like, you know, just basically how our relationship mm -hmm. just was, you know, growing over the time. He, he was a big fan of mine. And um, as I was playing with the other 18s for three years, you know, of course, playing up in, in you know, America being a very physical country, you know, mm -hmm. very into, you know, a lot of those kids in the academies back then, this was like around 2008, 2009, uh, were also playing different sports. Like they were triathletes or like, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, like being like a track runner or a footballer, like a, a actual American football player or some basketball player or whatever. Yeah. Like, you know, they would be playing multiple sports and that being so physical, it really helped me with my development physically. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I, I progressed the academy until I was 18 and when I was really the year from 17 to 18 in my senior year college at senior year high school that's really when I grew mm -hmm. that's really when I became six foot flat and that's when I was very uh, growing in, in in height and mm -hmm. uh, I was still relatively skinny I was still like 165 I never really broke 170 until college mm -hmm. because uh, that's obviously when we started doing a lot more weight training intensive like you know specific soccer movements mm -hmm. and, and specific soccer drills um whereas before it was just the basic you know you just go to the gym just go to the gym yeah, yeah. look up for the tanks on the beach yeah it was, <laughs> yeah it was uh it was just you know yeah. being an athlete like you yeah. know just uh you going to the gym just because you yeah know? exactly but you like you said that of course there was multiple 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 purposes to yeah. it yeah of course yeah. you wanted to you look good you yeah. know you wanted to you know obviously yeah. Have a multi-purpose. Um, most importantly, though, obviously the objective yeah, was to be yeah, productive in your in your progressing your yeah. career. Yeah. Um, what did uh, What did Jeremy see in you, um, and what did you see in yourself looking back? You know, how did he identify you as as such a standout player, and what 
helped you play three years up. Yeah. Well, that, that, pretty much what I described early on yeah. was that it was really my my way of staying busy. I was running down the channels, stretching defenders. Yeah. I was creating a lot of space for our midfield, for our wingers to attack spaces that are very dangerous uh, by, you know, obviously dragging players into different positions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was that tangible thing that he loved about me. It was of my work rate and my and my runs, and obviously, which which is quite a evident, which is a byproduct of it, was my endurance and my, my work rate. Yeah. Um, I was a very uh, very durable player. Very, mm -hmm. my stamina was very very mm -hmm. good. Um, How did you develop that stamina? How did you develop that busyness and that work rate? Was that Nate was that um, you know through through family development was that uh, playing on the streets with with friends yeah. how how did how did you develop that yeah I um, I have I'm actually like a first generation footballer like I never had anyone in my family that uh, actively pursued trying to play at any yeah. relative level that's interesting mm -hmm. uh, so I'm like a first generation footballer. Uh, in my family, everybody just liked it for fun, just yeah. supported it, so it didn't come from my family. Mm -hmm. um, my, my parents are relatively athletic, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like, yeah. there's, they, 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 were, they were good athletes. Yeah, like, they weren't yeah. like, you know, elite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I wouldn't say it came from my family. I'd say really, like I, like I mentioned really early on, it, like, football was always my, like, outlet. Yeah. Like, and I guess I'll say this openly, like, I never really... Never had a like a girl crazy phase. I never really chased women. I was always playing, always playing. I studying was close your ears, but I uh, was in my mind always secondary. Um, but you know, I I did what I needed to do. Yeah, I got my grades. I knew if I needed to study, I invested. But the second I felt like I was there, like you know, in high school I was an average three point five. GPA grade student, I wasn't like, you know, a 4.0 AP classes, honors classes. I, I took some honors, yeah, but yeah. I, I just did what was necessary, right? And um, to get me to college and, mm -hmm. and, and I did a decent SAT. So I guess to kind of like uh, paint the picture there for my, my educational background, um, I just truly invested all my time uh, with the ball in my foot. Like I would go get a ball and I would call, hit up a friend uh, before, this was before Facebook, before WhatsApp, mm -hmm. like, and just go ring on the door yeah. and ask, hey, you want to come kick around, whatever, and, and if they if they weren't around, I'd just go by myself. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I never bored myself, never bored myself. I just literally for hours would just kick the ball, and um, it was never something that I was just, like, trying to perfect. I mean, when you're a kid, you're just out there yeah. kicking a ball and you're chasing it. Problem. Yeah, exactly. Just and, and and that's I feel like really how I progressed. Honestly, like that, mm -hmm. truly what made me become a pro was just the love for football and just really just wanting to go kick on a rainy day, on a snowy day, when it was sunlight out, when it was mm -hmm. dark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what made me. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I think that just continuously keep growing as I got older because I kept getting better. Mm -hmm. I kept getting recognized. I kept getting, how do I say, I guess prof playing professionally became more and more realistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's really how I identified why or how, um, why I should continue. Because I mean, at any given point, if I was like 16, and I would have seen that like, hey, like my progression is kind of stunting or like I'm plateauing mm -hmm. or I most likely would have pivoted and probably just done something else. Mm -hmm. But I just kept seeing progression and yeah. I kept yeah. seeing that I was standing out in different categories. And um, yeah, I just loved it. I just mm -hmm. really in and out love football. Mm -hmm. Like, and it sounds cheesy or corny, but like, honestly, for me, like I, that would, it would to, to put it quite frank, it was stupid. It was like the, my girlfriend was pretty much football. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, it was yeah. like when you're a teenager, you fall into this phase where you know you start finding girls interesting. You yeah. start finding a social life interesting. You know, you're you're under a lot of stress in school. Um, you know, social pressure and everything. And I kid you not, like I never felt that. Yeah, never, yeah, yeah. never, never. I just that's huge. Going, That's huge. Going about my life with the ball on my foot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, that's huge. I mean, I, I, I remember, I always refer back to this quote by Sturridge. He said the most important ages for a footballer are between 14 and 18. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, that's when all the shiny stuff comes yeah. around. You start to get into girls. You start to yeah. see nice clothes. You yeah. start to go out to clubs. The yeah. drinking comes around. That's right. So like you did, if you can take that phase and make those phases a head down phase and you're just focused, no distractions, yeah. I think you're really advanced. Because talking from a personal perspective, that's kind of when I declined. You know, okay. I, I was one of the better players, okay. you know, in the state yeah. at 13, 14. Yeah. And then all the shiny stuff came around yeah. and I started getting into that. Okay. Um, stopped playing the game for about two years, oh, wow. like, like competitively. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, I came back and, you know, I was in the middle of the pack. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, I'm grateful for that because I probably wouldn't be where I'm at now doing what I'm doing right. without that, yeah. you know, and I always say, you know, the reason that I do these podcasts, the reason that I put out all these content is I want to be the mentor and the big brother that I never had because yeah. I'm an only child. I never had guidance and I wish I had people steering me the right way. So, yeah. you know, you can see the contrast here and, and definitely go down this route, yeah. and go down this road be in love with the game, be in love with the ball, because we were even talking before this, women are beautiful, women are great, but they can be distracting, they can take you off your track. Yeah. The better you are as a man, and the better you are in your craft, and the more dedicated and disciplined you are, the better quality of friends and women that you're gonna meet eventually. So, That's right. you know, I think the goal is to focus on your craft and hone in on it, yeah. and the right people will be attracted to you. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I think essentially really, if there was like a piece of advice that I feel like would be really important is, is really down, the, down along the line what you were saying. Yeah. If you're really serious about your career and you, you really want to become a pro footballer, I, I would strongly advise to listen to what Rick said. If you're in the ages, like, you know, right around puberty, like entering 12, 13, 14, 15, those ages are, are massive because like Rick just demonstrated a lot of different distractions will come along and um, if you're truly serious and you're dedicated and you you overcome those distractions by the time you're 16 17 18 and you you've developed your skill set into a way that becomes lucrative to become a pro because by the time now then in, in how the US soccer scene and just world football scene in general is kind of like built they know if you're gonna be a pro footballer by the time you're 15. Like, when you're 15 years old, they can tell if the skill set that you possess and, or the framework that you're working with, like, you know, in terms of how tall you are, how big you are, whatever, there's different metrics that they're, and different types of, you know, things that they're evaluating that they can tell by a very young age if you're gonna make it or not. And, According to this, I guess, formula, or I guess these evaluations, I was outside of this, outside of this box, like in terms of size, but I was all in, in terms of my characteristics, my dedication, um, in terms of how physically, how, I guess, disadvantaged I was, but how well I was working with what I had. Like people could just tell like, this kid wants to play. Like he just, he just doesn't care. He's, he's, he's not afraid to run past a guy that's two feet taller than him, or he's not afraid to go into a one-on-one. -on -one. So yeah, I feel like really that's essential to what, what Eric was saying was that if you can overcome those adversities by the time you're 12, 13, 14, 15, and you progress and you train hard, you, you, you will know if you're on the right path. And I think that that's definitely something, a marker that, that will, will determine a lot about your career. Like Rick said, like he took a two year break and maybe he didn't excel to the heights of where he could have if he would have continued and been dedicated. But also, to add on to that, like you said, you wouldn't be the man you are today. And the same as me, like, you know, I, um, yeah, I obviously kept following that path and, um, and I, I was going down a really good road. Um, so I guess to, to elaborate on that, like when I, when I got to college as a freshman, obviously through Jeremy Gunn, um, I, I had a really early rise. Um, I had a really early, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's more. Uh, I had a really early rise uh, as a freshman. So I actually became the 
freshman of the year in the NCAA in 2011, and um, I was leading my team in goals. I led my team to the national championship of the NCAA Division I. Um, I had the most goals in the playoffs. Um, I, had, I, I was the most productive player on the team at 18. So that's why what Jeremy Gunn saw in me as a 15-year-old boy, he saw the 18-year-old version of me. And that's what manifested. And how it manifested was because he knew what my skill sets were. And the system that he was building, I was perfect for that system. So basically he took my tools and perfected his system that would enhance other players around me and their, and their skill level. So I was making players around me better in order, or I guess by me making those runs, by me being dangerous, by me being busy, by me being uh, tenacious and, and not stopping and, and kept going and my stamina was just relentless. Um, that's what made my wingers better. That's what made my number eights better. That's what made my center backs less, having to defend less because their defenders have to defend more. And it just helped my team. And basically what, what happened was that uh, I, I had a really, really fast um, rise in college. And then I immediately got into the top, top, top uh, of the names in college soccer. And uh, like just to mention a few, Will Trapp, uh, which is a huge footballer. He's a big name in, in MLS. Um, DeAndre Yedlin uh, was in my class. Um, uh, he obviously, US International, went to the World Cup. Um, huge name in US soccer. Um, yeah, and, 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 and there, were, there were others uh, that were a little bit older than me that currently you know, are having amazing careers and didn't have that same rise um, or that same profile in college. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's not really about like, you know, how, how good you are in a certain period of time. It's it, like everybody can have br a brilliant season like that one hit wonder, but it's about consistency. It's about consistently performing at that level. And if it's not exactly at that level, somewhere close to it. Thank you so much for being here. You can find the app on rickfitacademy.com. So where, I'm oh, sorry, you want to say something? No, yeah, I just want to, with that being said, you know, um, Jeremy Gunn, you know, seems like a, like a visionary, great coach, like you said, but I think, you know, him seeing that in you is very interesting and, and I want to compare it to what we got going on and, um, you know, just maybe coaches are watching some advice for them and, and just, you know, kids as well, but, you know, as a young player, when you were, when he saw you at 15, did he do anything specific that you remember to continue grooming you, keep you on that path? Did, what Any type of specific advice he gave you, specific quotes that really stuck in your head and, and led you to that rise? Because, you know, as we see, you're just going up. You're just continue, continuing to go up. And, you know, with that being said, did he say it? Did you have any other mentors in your ears saying it? Because like we said, 14 to 18 is huge. Yeah. So if we could give them some advice, yeah. uh, do you remember anything specific? Well, I, I just really remember him, you know, telling me and my parents throughout the recruiting process about like my skill sets, about what separates me from the rest and what makes me so attractive to him and, and how he can integrate that into his system. So basically his belief in me was really what I think helped me to rise to those levels because even if I had a bad game, he would still play me. If I scored, obviously he would play me, but it wasn't like, and, and that wasn't that immediate uh, success in mm. college. I had a seven game dry spell, mm. my first seven games in college, and seven games is a lot of college. Seven games is about a third of the regular season. So they play about approximately, depending on conference and depending on which conference and depending on how many uh, out of conference games mm -hmm. you play like it really depends on your schedule but rule of thumb you usually play around 18 to 20 games mm -hmm. in college so mm -hmm. seven games was was a lot out of dry spell uh, and that's from the first game of the season to the seventh and I finally scored on my seventh and I started that game and I hadn't scored in six games and there was no there was no reason he needed to start an 18 year old boy mm -hmm. you know that he has 
veteran players on the bench like that already have four years of experience or a fifth year senior that had an ACL injury or something coming mm-hmm. back from injury. He could play the experienced players, but he just gave me that belief. Yeah. He yeah. believed in me. Yeah. And if I was scoring, if I was not scoring, he saw that my off the ball work was helping others mm-hmm. and making others better. Mm-hmm. And um, I guess to the question specifically, it wasn't something specifically he said. He let he let my development take its natural course. Yeah, he was monitoring from a distance, and he never hands on did anything. Mm-hmm. He just said, "That's what I like, mm-hmm. and this is what I like, and this is how I see you integrated in my system." And it was basically his simple his, the simplicity behind it. There was it was never forced. There was no manipulation. There was it, it, it just took the relationship between us took its natural course. Mm. And his consistency in terms of his words, like you know, saying like, you know, this was a good run, this was a good game, this was a good action, when I was at fifteen through eighteen, led to me continuing those habits from three years into college. Which made me successful. With that, that speaks a lot about Jeremy and on him being truthful to me. Mm-hmm. He was being honest on when I could improve and when I couldn't. But when I was doing well, he was being honest. Like this is what I like. This is what yeah. I see. Yeah. And it was truly his belief. So mm-hmm. that's that's what I felt. It's a feeling. It's mm-hmm. body language. Sure. Okay. With that being said, you know we're not all so lucky. We all don't have coaches who that's believe right. in us. That's right. right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what advice would you give to to the audience who? who doesn't have a coach who, who truly believes in them. Yeah, well, then you flip the coin. There's two sides to the coin. You need to be the one believing in yourself. That's really where I think uh, every player believes, to the, it believes in themselves, I feel like, to a certain extent. And then there's like this boost that comes when other people believe in you. And that's really how players excel, right? It's, it's by teamwork. Mm-hmm. It's you contribute what you can. And then the team adds on certain aspects to you in, in your persona and in just your overall chemistry of the team, which helps you excel. But in the end of the day, the only person that is responsible for your own development, the person that is responsible for waking up and going to the gym, the person who's responsible for taking care of your nutrition, the person who's responsible for taking care of your, your, your cardio training, the person who's in charge of just every specific aspect of football is yourself. So, no, there's this great quote that pretty much aligns with with this, what I'm saying, and it's that, like, um, no one will work harder for yourself than you. So, if you rely on other people, you will fall short to where you wanna go. Like, you wanna become great, you need to take every step into your own hands and take self accountability and this is what we were preferencing or this is what we were talking about before is that characteristics of a person that will help them excel to the top are of course consistency determination and perseverance and i think that's that's the formula to belief Mm -hmm. because if you believe in yourself you're gonna be, you're gonna persevere. You're gonna keep going. You're gonna be persistent. Like you're gonna keep persisting through hard times, through good times, you're gonna just keep going. And the consistency will develop because through the good and through the bad, you're still going about your business. So I think really believing in yourself is a formula that can consist of, I, there's obviously probably more, yep. but I feel like the key Those ones are, are pers- being persistent, yep. being consistent, and yeah, that, that, that's definitely, mm-hmm. definitely something that you should try to adopt into your daily routine. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I tell players all the time, you know, it's about, you know, extreme ownership. Jocko Willing talks about it all the time. You need to take complete control of your development because yeah. like, like I said before, we may not all be so lucky to have a coach who supports us yeah, and believes right. in us. We may not all have parents who support and believe in us. But like Giuseppe said, the one and only person that you can always trust and go back to 
is yourself. So if you take full accountability, if you take extreme ownership in doing all the right things every single day, you will be successful right. in this game. And, right. and then you will take it into the next phase of your life, That's like right. we're talking about. Yeah. Just because you work hard and um, you believe in yourself, that doesn't mean that things will always work out the way that you envision them to. So like, for example, like if you invest hundreds of hours um, or thousands of hours into, into your craft and, and you truly in your, in your mind and in your being believe that you're going to become a professional footballer, that doesn't mean you will. You know, there's obviously an element of luck and an element of things that you cannot control that take in place or that come in place uh, to becoming a professional. Um, and that's not to say that that you should give up. Mm -hmm. Like you definitely need to that. That's once again, the, the, the perseverance, you have to overcome those obstacles and you. This is this would probably be one of the most profound um advices for young players that I would give is that like you have to learn how to uh, receive like a no mm. as an answer like that's like you, you need to learn that because I think that you'll most definitely for every yes you'll get about 50 to 100 no's maybe more like I, I don't know like it, I don't know the exact uh, percentage or the ratio but you'll get way more no's then you'll get yeses. So, um, and also to note, this is quite obvious, but you don't need like a portfolio or a list of clubs to want you. You need one because you can only play for one club at a time. And you need to make the best out of that opportunity for that one club that believes in you. And prime example, we all know this story is, is Jamie Vardy. I mean, look, I mean, this guy went from pub football to the Premier League mm -hmm. and nobody wanted him. And I would say on a lower level, that's something very similar in terms of characteristics. What I had, like he's a very busy player, energetic, fast, hardworking. And I think I had a lot of those characteristics during my professional career, mm -hmm. but obviously not at that level. Um, but that's just kind of, I guess, to demonstrate, I guess, what what kind of a player I was. Mm very lively um, and <laughs> chattery I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. had a big mouth yeah um, wasn't always good but <laughs> it just it, it, yeah. it's just me man um, but yeah like I, I, w I truly would say that this would be one of the most profound advices for young footballers yeah. is, is learning to take the no and and and, and pretty much preserving from, from that because don't let a no stop you from continuing mm -hmm. because you'll receive many you'll, be, you'll receive so many 100%. and you just need to know that you need one yes I you don't that. need a hundred yeses you need one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and make the best out of it make that one yes prove to yourself don't prove to others you need to prove to yourself that you're good enough and that you can continue and that you can reach and attain the professional level. Mm -hmm. But in for being grateful that you received that opportunity, prove them right. You Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. The priority should be you need to prove yourself that you're good enough. Mm -hmm. And once you've done that, prove them right that they believed in you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's definitely something that, um, that, that, that should be a mindset that you should carry. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I put the content out the other day and I, I fully believe in that. Football is an opinion based game. Absolutely, yeah. You know, you're oh, not sure. always gonna be you're not always gonna fit into the coach's system. Yeah. You're not always gonna be the player that, that specific coach likes and yeah. loves. But like we talked about from the very beginning of the conversation, if you focus on what you can control you focus on your strengths and what you can bring to a team. You look at yourself as an asset to help the team. Yeah. Then you will advance up the ranks and you will find a coach who believes in you. Absolutely. But if you are constantly flustered by people telling you no or saying maybe or not believing in you, you're never going to make it. But like you, yeah. we said, if you find that self-belief in yourself, and that's why I think training is so important. Because it constantly instills the self-belief. Yeah. I think training every single day and being disciplined 
dialed in and consistent with your routines yeah. for the most part of the time really helps you build that self-confidence, self-belief, and self-discipline, yeah. which is going to lead to the opportunities. So yeah, I mean, there's another quote out there that I really have loved is, you know, if you don't want to go out and work for yourself today, go out and work for the people who believe in you. Mm. Like Giuseppe said, mm. go out, work hard, and prove the people right who believe in you, and prove the people wrong who didn't believe in you. Mm. One last technique that I fo- that I recommend before we dive into the next topic is building your own mental Rolodex. I learned this from David Goggins. Mm -hmm. So basically what you do here, it's very simple. You take out a notepad or you take out your iPhone and in your notes and you write the people who didn't believe in you. Mm -hmm. And every single time that you don't want to get up out of bed and train, you don't want to eat the right things, you don't want to sleep before 11, you don't want to sleep eight hours, you don't want to do your extra stretching, go back to that mental Rolodex and remind yourself the people who didn't believe in you. Mm -hmm. And then you will constantly want to put that work in. I think for me, that's one of the best things that I've developed, that I recommend to clients, that I recommend to anyone struggling with motivation. Build your own mental Rolodex. Yeah. No, there's great value in writing things down. Yeah, Uh, it's true. Um, Because you're manifesting them. You're manifesting them onto paper and um, you're bringing a thought into life. Um, So obviously this Rolodex that you're speaking of might not be that manifestation, Mm -hmm. but it is creating something that you can reflect on and the like we're beings that also forgets so we don't always have like a clear um memory of how certain things went Mm -hmm. down Mm -hmm. but if you have like you know notes or if you have like some type of like like you said like some type of list that you know this person and this people or just list of people have this place in my life or in mm, my career mm. if you have a list that's already a lot you know yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. like you kind of want to you kind of want to yeah show that this list of people you guys were wrong you know but that shouldn't be the priority of course the priority needs to be prove yourself right that's the priority because like if, if that that's also self-belief it's you're you're putting your mental state and you're you're manifesting it physically Mm -hmm. and that's 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 real stuff you know because like this could also be a reality right you're proving someone wrong on this list maybe they don't care Mm -hmm. maybe they're like well okay i made a decision 20 years ago or 10 years ago when you were five and or even you're 10 now you're a pro footballer now i'm out of football i don't really care if you made it or not you know and that shouldn't be your motivation to prove sure. someone wrong. It, and and, and it, it can be. Yeah. But it should be the priority. Different source. Yes, yeah. exactly. And the more accountability you take upon yourself, um, the, the the your longevity, or I guess like throughout your career, the more successful you'll be. And Absolutely. that's my opinion. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just to touch on to that, you know, like Giuseppe said, you know, that's, that's dark side motivation. You know, I, I fully believe what you said the best way to continue to be disciplined and follow along the path is continue to look yourself in the mirror, Mm -hmm. being proud of yourself and continuing to prove yourself right. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point because a lot of people self doubt and not, it's it's not just along the the belief It's you know, there's this like Instagram video that I saw on, on, it was a reel. Mm. Um, and people kind of took it with like humor and it was about Snoop Dogg. Mm. Um, and I, I don't remember exactly, so I don't want to quote it, it word for word and I don't want to quote the situation, mm. but basically what the real was Snoop Dogg opened something, some type of, I think it was some type of real estate, something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know if it was a that store. That guy's in everything. Yeah. I don't know if it was a store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if it was like, you know, um, I, I, I'm not sure. But basically, there was an award ceremony, or I guess like this inauguration, or something of that sort. There was a mm. celebration that Snoop Dogg went and, and and presented a speech, and basically, he went up there on stage, and uh, he thanked himself. Mm. He said, like you know, he he obviously listed people he thanked, and then he said, last but not least, and probably most importantly, I want to thank me, and I want to thank myself for getting up every day. 
I want to thank myself for working hard every day. I want to thank myself for believing in me and not letting getting people in my way. I want to thank myself for being, you know, all of those things, right, that we mm-hmm. talked about. And mm-hmm. I think that's super important. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. And, and not even in an arrogant way. It's mm-hmm. more in a, I guess, more more in a self-aware and self-confidence way. And mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I think there's there needs to be more of that. And, and obviously not make that egotistic. Yeah. Like, of yeah. course, there's a yeah. fine line between, yeah. you know, being arrogant and being self-aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want that to cross like exactly. you, you don't want that gray zone like you want to be clear that look i'm i'm proud of myself yeah you know i'm doing this for me and i'm i'm proud of what i'm doing absolutely you know? absolutely i mean i think that's an excellent point you bring up and 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 you know i, I think the reason people don't do that is because they don't want to sound arrogant they don't want to sound cocky but for me if you put in the work every single day you're consistent you should be proud of yourself and you should be able to pat yourself on the back in private and in public without being called arrogant and cocky. And that's why when people always get on Zlatan or they get on Cristiano and they say he's arrogant and cocky, I come back and I say they deserve to be. You know how much work they've they've put in to get where they are, what they've gone through? And honestly, you know, to the people who've said that to me, when they say that, I don't respect them anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, I was in uh, Croatia. I was with a buddy. Without with, we were out with uh, two girls. They were actually Swedish, and they said they don't like Zlatan. Hmm. I said I'm ready to leave this dinner right now. <laughs> 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 no, but seriously, you know, if you don't respect someone's hard work, wow. like for me, like it's the same thing on, on social media. Like some people are like, like, dude, you get pissed when people comment negatively on your post or this and that. And I've just gotten to the point where I don't look at it anymore. Right. But for me. As a person that I think I'm a very hard worker and yeah. I'm consistent and, and I do all the right, you know, I don't do all the right things, but I do 80% of the things that are right every day. I would never go on someone's post who's trying to put out good energy right. and yeah. positive energy into a post and, and comment yeah. negatively. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because for me, that's a reflection of yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, being able to be proud of yourself when your head hits the pillow is massive and and those days add up and it leads to the self-belief and confidence we're talking about for sure Ted Ted, you you made a really good point about Zlatan and and Cristiano Um, I even think that they're completely different in their ways so it's like I I would find Zlatan very annoying if he wasn't who he was and I'm I'm gonna explain I break it down why like Zlatan always did what he said yeah. He always followed up his words with actions. And that's why I respect him so much. And that's why he's not arrogant. He's not. He is super self-aware. He is, he's hyper aware of himself. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm, He mm-hmm. just knows at what level he's performing. And he knows where everyone else is. So he's very aware mm-hmm. of his surroundings. And like, what, can you, what can you say? I mean, this guy is probably, in terms of strict center forward, number nine, he has to be in the conversation of top five in the last mm. 15 years. Mm. I don't know. A long time. He's yeah. retired yeah. at 41. Last year, he completely changed the face of AC Milan that didn't even make Champions League, that didn't even, like, that they were, they were going through a massive slump or bad time at Milan and then he brings them and resurrects the club to to glory and Mm. and leads them to Champions League and also wins the Serie A and the Scudetto and um, yeah I I have a lot of respect for Zlatan it's not like I per se like him and and his antics Mm. that's not what I think Mm. what makes me respect him I think what I respect is he says something and then he does it and there is nothing more like that's the coolest thing ever, man. Like, that's yeah. like, I mean, yeah. you're literally man. Like, he's saying what he's going to do and he follows it up and does it. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. I, like mm-hmm. that is, that's the coolest thing, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't, like, yeah. I can't think of anything cooler. Um, and, you know, the confidence that you need to say that, like, mm-hmm. man, mm-hmm. you know, at the, at the peak of world football, there's mm-hmm. no level higher than what he's performing at. Yeah. And um, now I guess to, to contrast that to Cristiano, I think it's a, a it's along the lines of what you were just describing right before. The thing is, is that 
people hate Cristiano so much. Why would he give in to the hate? Yeah. He needs to counter that hate somehow. He's clearly, I mean, look, he's a good looking guy. Mm -hmm. He's a super athlete. I mean, look at his body. I mean, it's crazy. This guy's a freak of nature. Yeah. He's a goal scoring, but he can't stop scoring. Everywhere he goes, he just scores. He's a pretty, uh, I would say, elite. Yes, he is the most assist in, in history of, of the Champions League. He's, he's a creator, too. Like, you know, he started off his career as a winger. He was not always a goal scorer, in and out goal scorer. Mm. He was a winger, a young and up and coming skiller. He was someone that would just, you know, do all the fancy step overs, pirouettes, drags, and pulls, and just was trying to make a fool out of his mm -hmm. or an example mm -hmm. out of his defender. And then there came this period where it was probably around 2007, 2008. Um, even 2009 in those years where he just stopped the fluff and he just became a very productive and direct player very effective just mm -hmm, straight mm -hmm. to the chase like mm -hmm. I'm gonna shoot I'm gonna I'm gonna cross I'm gonna mm -hmm. score or whatever like mm -hmm. and, and he just really got into that efficient mindset and that's what won him the Ballon d'Or mm -hmm. and that's what won champ uh, United the Champions League yeah and I guess to come back to our point from before is that he received so he received on, now currently on social media so much hate from people he was like why why does he not have the right to defend himself and have this perspective of himself that he's not what you portray him to be that's not arrogance that's just even if anything he's defending himself from people who have a false perspective of him mm -hmm. you, know? you know you know why because we were talking about this before because being disciplined is very, very hard. Exactly. And when you are disciplined, yes. you scare others. That's right. That's right. And I, I've That's had right. this personally myself when I've gone to clubs, when I've been to new countries. When you come in and you're very disciplined and you do all the right things on and off the pitch, people get scared. That's right. Yeah. And that scariness leads to them trying to tear you down. That's right. Because they yeah. don't want to put in the work themselves. That's right. They don't want to put in the extras on and off the field. That's right. So they think tearing you down and talking crap behind your back is going to help their life be easier. Right. And at the end of the day, I mean, you know, I want to go back to your point, but don't be afraid to be disciplined. Don't be yeah. afraid to do the right things because right, yeah. the right people and the right coaches like Jeremy Gunn who believed in him are going to see that. They're going to respect that. And they're going to give you those opportunities that are going to help you take you to the next level. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's a really good point. Yeah, like um, he, he gets a lot of hate for his image, right? For taking care of himself, yeah. like for really looking after his health. Yeah. And like, like I, f I find that very low. Like yeah. that's such a low way of living. Like, yeah. you know, of course, look, I'm not anywhere near to his level. But I respect him for what he does. I couldn't do what he does. If not, I would be him. But everybody would be him if they could do what he mm -hmm. does. But the insecurity and the jealousy, like you just explained, just causes a reaction that's really easy. And it's just to hate and yep. just to pull you down and tear you down. And look, I don't even want to get into this, this, in this debate and this topic. But for me, he's the greatest player of all time. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. my opinion. Yeah. You know, and like, I don't want to hear any slack or yeah. I don't want to hear any type of negative comments or whatever. But that's my opinion. Yeah. And I'll tell you why, because I personally, why this is why it's my opinion is because I can relate to him more than I can relate to Messi. Messi was born with this extraterrestrial ability yeah. that is just not comprehensible to me. He has this hyper intelligence and this like vision and this craftiness and this just technical ability and mm. tactical awareness that I just can't comprehend. But what I can comprehend and what I related to a lot to in my career was the hard work and the discipline that Cristiano went from being a youth player into mm. Cristiano, the Champions League winner, five-time Champions League winner. He's more relatable. He's re relatable to me. Mm -hmm. And to me, like I mentioned before, you need to select the player that you want to emulate and you want to replicate that game and, and, and introduce that into your game, mm. you can also pick and choose certain characteristics of the greatest mm. that you like. And his discipline and his... He, he selected a path, man. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. selected a path. Mm -hmm. And unapologetically, just 
went through that path. Yeah, yeah. Through the BS of everyone that everyone said, like the negativity yeah, and everything. Yeah. He just said, this is, this is the road I'm going down. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, I respect that, man. Mm. And it's relatable to me. For sure. Because like you mentioned, like when you're disciplined, you work hard, people, people want to tear you down for it because they don't want you to elevate the standard because that means that either they have to elevate their standard yeah. or they just they just cannot understand what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Like they don't understand why you are that way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that ter- turns not just only into jealousy, it could also turn into just, you know, just in and out hate. Like, mm-hmm. like I don't understand why he's this way. Mm-hmm. Like it's just annoying me and then yeah. you just hate on the person. Yeah, I mean, you know, a thought that just sparked now as you're saying that is the reason your actions attract the people that are similar to you yeah. is because they feel those emotions. Yeah. They they know how good it feels to be disciplined, to work hard, because it produces results. It yeah. produces respect from other people. Yeah. So that just leads to genuine respect because they're more relatable. Yeah. You know, because yeah. then you have people that are more relatable to you. They respect you for what you do. Yeah. I I think that's what it's all about. Yeah. You know. So with that being said, let's let's dive back into your career. Yeah. Well, if you don't mind, let me let me pose yeah. a question yeah. real yeah. quick. I guess. Yeah. To the audience or to to a young pro footballer speaking. Uh, yeah. Listening. Um. So. I, I don't really like the GOAT debate. Like, I don't like the greatest of all time debate yeah, yeah, of, yeah, between yeah. Messi and Ronaldo. But I, I do like, I do like, who do you prefer? Because it's, it's, a, it's a Coke versus Pepsi thing, right? Because they're both the same product. And Messi, yeah, Messi and Ronaldo are both, in my opinion, the greatest of, our, of, of football. Not mm-hmm. just in of mm-hmm. our time, but just in general. So it's like, if I would have to ask a question to the audience, who do you prefer and why? Why do you prefer Messi over Ronaldo, and why do you re- prefer Ronaldo over Messi? And I don't want this to be let me criticize the other party. It's let me explain why this person or this player is better. Like mm-hmm. why is Ronaldo for you the better player than Messi, and vice versa? Because it's like we said before, like the negativity just doesn't bring anywhere. Yeah, yeah it doesn't bring yeah. anybody anywhere. Absolutely. So I think that's that's something that yeah. interests me a lot yeah. on why there's this goat debate. Of course, yeah. you want to now that Messi won the World Cup. Of course, yeah. like yeah. a lot of people are shifting over to oh, that's yeah. the hardest competition yeah. to win. But yeah. individually, I'm just curious to know. Yeah. Who's your Who's your preference? Yeah. Yeah. You want to know that and you're also trying to help the engagement of the YouTube video because you realize more comments brings more likes and more views. I mean, that's, I guess, a tactic or a technique that I didn't currently think of. But yeah, that will, de- that will definitely... Uh, always looking out. Oh that, boy, always looking out. That's most definitely a byproduct of, uh, yeah, of, of, this, of this question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, brother. So yeah, let's, uh, let's take you back into your career. Yeah. After that, that stellar first season, yeah. where'd you move from there? Yeah, so obviously I progressed as a sophomore and as a junior in at UNC Charlotte, and um, I had I followed up with with uh, great performances. I really did. So uh, my freshman year was ten goals, two assists, and then my sophomore year I followed up with nine goals, seven assists, and then I ended up capping off uh, my junior season with I think it was like eight goals, three assists. So it was kind of the weakest one out of them all, but in general. Um, I was very consistent in college, you know, I, I was always producing, always scoring, um, and that led me to believe that I could make it into the MLS, so I got drafted as a junior by mm-hmm. the Chicago Fire, yeah. So that's where I started my career. Um, it's kind of, for me, a, a very difficult topic to speak about, not saying that I don't speak about it, I speak about it all the time, but yeah. just kind of, it gets me a little bit upset from time to time, but just, uh, you know, how my my professional career really... Uh, really ended up playing out. Um, I thought I deserved a little bit better at the fire. Mm. thought I deserved the chance. Mm. I was, uh, I scored a, quite some goals. I scored like three goals uh, for the reserve team, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which in the landscape of today would be like MLS Next Pro mm. for the guys, uh, for the young guys. Um, we were just playing reserve league games, which uh, had no value. There was no value in them. They were just literally organized games so that the players that didn't play in the MLS were playing games throughout the year. Mm. And they served no, no purpose. Like, the reserve league was in the MLS back then, was there was no purpose to it. Um, just basically, I guess, a tool for the coaches to use to see if the player would be good enough to utilize mm. in an MLS match mm. in the future. Mm. So they ended up... So my first preseason game ever 
as at the fire, I actually scored the only goal. We won one zero. It was against Florida Gulf Coast University, and I scored a goal. So I scored the first ever uh, preseason game or for my professional debut, I guess, as in uh, coming out of college in preseason. I scored a goal, and um, you know, it gave me a lot of confidence moving mm. forward. And and then in the second one, I didn't even play. And then I was kind of questioning, you know, why? I was like, I thought I was on the right track and mm. I was doing fine in trainings or whatever. And um, anyways, preseason came to an end. And when we were done with preseason, we went from Florida, we went back to Chicago. Um, there was talks about me potentially getting loaned out and stuff like that. And I didn't really understand what that meant at the time. But I was playing games with the reserves and, mm. and I was scoring goals. And then that chatter kind of went away. Um, because I was scoring and I was doing well. I played an open cup um, and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, that, uh, that kind of was like the beginning of my career and mm. I thought I was doing fine. I thought I was doing well cause I was scoring and I was producing and then, you know, I thought I was fighting for, for a spot on the team. And mm -hmm. this is actually a really crazy story. Uh, it's actually, it actually really is crazy to me because reliving it in my mind, it feels so real and it could have changed the course of my career, but I actually ended up, uh, earning myself the position to travel with uh, the first team with ML in MLS mm -hmm. uh, to DC United. And um, this was uh, around April, um, April of 2014. And um, so, like I said, I was scoring and doing well with the reserves or whatever. And um, the coach says, you're coming to DC. I was, I was super hyped. I was really mm -hmm. excited. Like, I was really happy. I thought that, like, you know, I was really doing the right things to, to move up into the first team. And the game kicks off, we're, we're down, um, or no, I'm sorry, we're up 2-1, to one, excuse me, we're winning 2-1 mm -hmm. in D.C. away from home, mm -hmm. and um, it's like approximately the 80th minute, and then my coach, the assistant coach, um, says, Giuseppe, go get warmed up, we need you, and I was like, oh wow, like, this is in D.C., yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, 21 years old or whatever, extremely yeah. hyped, about, about to get my debut or whatever. Put on my jersey, put on my put on my shin pads, and um, I go. I get. I collect the paper, the sub paper that they that they prepared to get in, and um, I kid you not, this is a real story. This is really what happened. Um, the referees logged in the, the change, like the the substitution, mm. and the next time the ball was gonna exit the field, I was gonna enter. Yeah. What happens is the the ball stays in the field for about ninety seconds. Yeah, it just yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in the, it doesn't go out. There's no fouls. There's nothing happening. Just the ball's in the run of play for ninety seconds, and then um, the ball goes down the right flank, and I was here on the side of the right flank, mm. so I'm seeing everything happen in lifetime from like probably like twenty meters away. Mm. This guy named Patrick Niarco takes the ball down the sideline. He whips it across. And this guy, this center forward named Quincy Ameriqua, yeah. finishes it, yeah. and he scores, and it's 2-2. <laughs> and of course, me, I was really excited, you know, oh, yeah, let's go. Um, but little did I know that that was probably, selfishly for myself, the worst thing that could have happened yeah. in that moment. Yeah. So what happened was... Um, What's going on? I hope you're having a fantastic day so far and I hope you're feeling great. When I was four years old, I wanted to be a professional footballer, but I never knew how. I didn't know the drills and the exercise. I didn't know how long. I didn't know how to do them. So I created an app specifically for that four-year-old me. Within this app, you're gonna have access to 1,350 and more videos where I coach you through for at least a minute within each video on how to do each exercise and then I let you know how long to do it. This app will take you from start to finish in your training session and I promise you, if you are consistent with this app, you will reach the next level. Today is the time to get started. You got a seven day free trial on your hands. Click this link below, get in there, and if you don't like it, cancel. You won't have to pay any money, and then I'll never see you again. But I promise you, you will like this app, so I'll see you in there. The the coaches were speaking and kind of like, you know, very quickly, like, you know, oh, uh, stop the sub. We don't want the <laughs> sub, we don't want this sub, or whatever. And they take this veteran player, Chris Rolf, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is a all three of those guys, Patrick Niarco, uh, Quincy Americo, and Chris Rolf, yeah. ballers, yeah. by the way, top, top of the line, yeah. MLS players, really. Yeah. 
big names in MLS. Um, yeah, um, I I didn't get subbed in. Wow. Yeah, I didn't get subbed in. Yeah. So that was that was heartbreaking for me. Man. Yeah. That broke my heart really, and um, it wasn't really that that moment broke my heart so much because as a twenty one year old boy, I was really hopeful that like I'm mm. I'm I almost got in. Yeah. I almost got in. So what happened was what ended up happening was why it was so heartbreaking was because you know the coach wrapped his arms around me and he said yeah you know I'm sorry I had to do that tactical change and I said like, coach I understand thank you mm. for talking to me. The, I repeat myself again this is the heartbreaking part. <laughs> I go to training well we fly home to Chicago I go home mm. and then go up to training on Monday. I'm not even planned in the session like my like I wasn't even planned in the session. And we were doing recovery with the starting group and then the reserve the reserves and the players in the 18 that didn't play were playing scrimmages and I wasn't involved. Mm. And I found that extremely strange. Like I was like, this is not normal. And I didn't train that whole day. Like the whole day I was just there. And the coach pulls me into the into the locker room after training. And he's like, yeah, Giuseppe, look like um, it's just really difficult for me to describe to you, but like we we just need you to get games that are meaningful, and we mm. need you to go on loan. And then I was like, but coach, like I was literally on the line <laughs> about to get in, like I was about to get minutes, like yeah. I can prove that I'm good enough. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah, but we think that you could get more consistent, meaningful minutes on loan. So sure. Whatever, mm. send me on loan to the Charlotte Eagles, which is, you know, they were the they went to the final of the USL championship back in the day. It was USL, mm. uh, USL 1 or USL Pro. They went to the final and lost to Orlando City. And, um, you know, it was a strong program. You know, they, were, they went to the final. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, that's a good opportunity. And it's in Charlotte. That's where I went to college. People know mm-hmm. me there. Mm-hmm. So I went and... I got some decent minutes, you know, I didn't play a, like every single game, every single minute, but I played a lot and I scored one goal. And then in the MLS, there's this rule or there was this thing back then in 2014 that there was this contract, mm-hmm. like there's this clause in the contract that was a semi-guaranteed contract. And semi-guaranteed contracts mean that the contract but beyond July 1st become guaranteed. Yeah, yeah. But on June 30th or June 31st, they're not guaranteed like on June 30th they're not guaranteed they're yeah. semi guaranteed mm-hmm. so guess what day I got received a call 31st well yeah the 30th of yeah. June I get a call yeah. hey Giuseppe like this is the general manager of the Chicago Fire yeah yeah this is a very uncomfortable discussion to be had but we're gonna let you go we're gonna wow. wave your we're gonna rave your wave you yeah. and uh and I was like, what does this mean? I was like, I have a contract yeah, like with yeah, the club yeah, like for yeah. a year. And he was explaining to me what it means and the clauses and everything. And of course, I didn't understand. I had no idea. So, yeah, I got released at 21 uh, from the fire. And I immediately started crying, of course. Like, mm. I didn't know what to do. I mean, I was 21 years old. I didn't, I didn't know anything about mm. contracts and mm. clauses. And I just wanted to play, right? Yeah. And... I was reflecting back to that moment of DC. I was like, but like, how's this possible? Like, I was, I was there, man. Yeah, yeah. Like, I was there. Yeah. It shows one, one, one simple action can change the path of your career. Like yeah, you yeah. Like I was seconds, like moments, like a handball away, a foul away, a throwing away, yeah. a corner away, a goal kick away from receiving my MLS debut, even if it was. Eight to six, eight or six minutes. Yeah, yeah it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah. That would have, for myself, for me, that would have changed a lot. Mm. Because at least I could have said, I did it, you know. But yeah. because I fell short to that, and then, you know, it still really hurts. But um, that's that's football. Yeah. And I learned that really late in life. I learned that really late in my career that that's just football. Yeah. But I was yeah. too busy with the injustice and with how unfairly I was being treated and that's like really what was bothering me at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that was a really, really emotional time for me. I was, it was really, really bad. Um, mm-hmm. I was really hurt. And, um, so how, how did, how did you deal with that? How, how did you move past it? 
I mean, very inexperienced. Um, I cried. Yeah. yeah I cried, yeah. I cried a lot. Yeah. yeah. And for two weeks I was without a club. Um, and then, um, I received a phone call from my agent and he, he got an opportunity to go to Orlando city. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just didn't know like how it worked. Like I didn't know the dynamics. Like I was very naive and I didn't understand the dynamics. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I got a call that I got an opportunity to go play for uh, the Orlando City Soccer Club. Mm. And I loved it there. It was amazing. Yeah. Really good Orlando's experience. Not bad. Yeah, really, really good experience. It was yeah. a great club. But at the end of the season, another heartbreak. Um, because I was, I, was, I was hopeful that they would take me to the MLS team. Mm. Because as a young, promising striker, someone maybe in the depth charts, you know, in between, like, you know, get two big older experienced guys, get him as a third, uh, like mm. a third player that has experience, but just like as a project player. But they didn't do that. They didn't, they didn't pick me to go to them last with them, which was really upsetting because my favorite player of all time, Kaka, was, um, was going to be on the roster in the next year in 2015 in MLS. And that would have been amazing for me mm. to, to be able to say that I played together with him, but that didn't happen. Um, so it's a little complicated just because of the dynamics and the landscape of US soccer where it was like at the time, but there's this other league called the NASL, which was deemed the second division. And that one was running parallel to the USL season, but mm -hmm. it extended longer. So how it worked was that there was this club, the San Antonio Scorpions that were interested in me mm -hmm. and they wanted me to come wrap up the season with them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which I ended up doing I ended up going to San Antonio and I wrapped up the season with them which I guess I can say that I ended up the year really really well because mm -hmm. we ended up winning the championship wow. while I was there for two and a half three months mm -hmm. yeah beating mm -hmm. some really really big guys like mm -hmm. like teams and then some guys on the on the team like like uh Roe play, play for the Cosmos New York Cosmos and some other guys that ended up coming on later, mm, but mm. it was a really good experience for me. Um, so I went to San Antonio Scorpions, which mm. no longer exists um, because they folded in the league, the NASO folded as a whole. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, then after that, I actually took uh, the opportunity to go to um, Chiasso, which is a second division team here in mm. Switzerland, because they actually scouted me and saw an opportunity for me to come over. Nice. So I trained with them and uh, I liked it and then I just took the opportunity to go. Um, Gianluca Zambrotto, which was a World Cup winner, was my coach. So mm. that was really attractive. That was really cool. A good experience. But mm. uh, he got fired. And when he got fired, that's when it went downhill for me and I didn't play anymore. Mm. So I played about 10 games. I think one of them was from the start. But, I, you know, I was finding my way mm. oh, it, there was there was there was good progression at the club for me and uh then when he got fired uh that was when things went downhill yeah. for me i didn't play anymore and the coach actually requested for me to leave like the coach was just like yeah you can you should just not mm. come back mm. because you won't play mm. so i found another move to go back to the states which is san antonio again so i went back there what year is this 2015 Quite. Yeah. how old were you i was 20 22. 22. 22. Yeah. And then you can imagine, like, just, I guess, recapping. A lot of moves in yeah, a short right, time. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's just what yeah. I was about to point out. Something yeah. to point out was the inconsistency of the U.S. soccer at that time. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. it was, I mean, imagine I was 21, 22, 20, 21, 22. And just, like, what that did for my mental state, it was just horrific. You know, I was just constantly moving from team to team, league to league continent the, the different continent and of course that move was on me like i decided to mm. go but just saying there was within a whole calendar year there was five clubs involved yeah. that's really bad yeah like that's not tough. good you don't yeah. want that but to sum up everything in 2014 i scored five goals officially and had like three assists mm. that's for a rookie eight goal contributions I mean, yeah, I, I thought that was pretty okay. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah, I didn't, yeah. I didn't rock it. I yeah, wasn't like, yeah. you know, the star, but for always having to readapt and change and, you know, getting used to new teammates, new environment, new apartment, mm. new place mm. to amass that was like an achievement for me. Mm. Like I thought about mm. that and I was like, you know, I, I'm proud of myself mm. despite how hard it was. But then going to Kiaso, you know, it was another really tough spell. 
um, and then I came back, and um, yeah, San Antonio, and I, I was planning on staying for a while, because mm. I liked it there, mm. I really liked San Antonio, but what happened was, uh, <laughs> they folded, well, yeah, the, the, the club folded completely, yeah. They, yeah. they seized operations, and they folded, and um, yeah, so I had to change again, so... Mm. I had, that was my seventh move in two years. I mean, it's really bad ratio, really bad. And then I ended up going um, in 2016 to the Fort Lauderdale Strikers, mm -hmm. which Ronaldo, R9, yeah. was an ambassador for the club and yeah. the face of the franchise, which made it really lucrative. So I got to meet him there and everything was really cool yeah, and yeah. everything was really shiny. And yeah. Uh, yeah, after like in March, they stopped paying us. <laughs> yeah, so we did. Wow, yeah, wow. they stopped paying us. So. They were having financial troubles and the investors stopped sending money and um, uh, yeah, that caused a lot of havoc and they were trying to release players mm. from contracts, mm. which they legally couldn't, but they mm. tried. And then they they started loaning out players and they started sending players on trades. So they came to me because I was young and they were like, well, hey, like your output, like you scored one goal in like 12 games for the club, mm. the amount of money you're earning to how much you're playing, how much you're producing is really poor, so we need to get rid of you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I was in a room with the coach, assistant coach, the director, and the goalkeeper coach. It was four of them, and there was me. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting across the table. 4v1. 4v1. They all spoke, they all spoke Portuguese. I didn't speak, of, I mean, I understood Portuguese. Yeah, I speak yeah, Spanish yeah. and Italian, but I didn't, I didn't speak yeah. their language, like their dialects. You ever tried one of those pastel donatas? No. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess that's on my to-do list now. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. So it was four on one, and man, I remember that experience. It was like the pressure that they were applying onto me. Yeah. Just to to leave, was in, was immense. Like I never felt that before. Yeah. It was like very unwelcoming, and but like, once again, ironically, that was the best thing that could happen to me. That move mm. from Fort Lauderdale to Canada, to a different country. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they had to ask me to sign documents was because I actually had to request a work, pe a work permit, a mm -hmm. work visa to Canada, and I would had to register with the FA in Canada. Mm -hmm. So they needed my signatures. They couldn't just trade me. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why they needed to talk to me. Yeah. And they were applying so much pressure mm -hmm. for me to go. But anyways, when I went to Canada in 2016, see, another move in the season like yeah. it's it's just the first three years were, were scandalous just mm -hmm, mm -hmm. constant move 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 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um that's where i found myself in canada and i had really really a good end to my six months there yeah uh again at the beginning i didn't play as much because i was new and i needed to find myself in the system but mm -hmm. once i did i scored a pretty much good amount of goals i think in the last 10 games i started i think like eight and scored four Wow. So that's really where I found myself. And that was a really good memory for me was Canada. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And at the end of the season, the coach wanted me to stay, but they wanted to basically like keep me at a lower cost. And then mm -hmm. I said, well, look, I feel like I deserve at least what my option is. And then they, we didn't agree. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up going to Puerto Rico FC, which was in the NASL as well back in the day, which is also second tier in America. Mm -hmm. And I progressed. That was where I elevated in, yeah. my, in my professional career was yeah. in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Um, that's, that was my best year. And I actually transitioned from a center forward to a winger, okay. to a right winger. Okay. Yeah, so that was, a, yeah. that was a big change. But I was, I, that was my best year. Mm -hmm. I played 25 or so, I think more, 27 or so, but 25 consistent games mm -hmm. of just football, one club, one club that believed in me, wanted to, push me and help me and I ended up res I ended up breaking the double digits I I think I had 10 or 11 goal contributions wow. so that was really my marker like 10 mm. goal contributions it's like important for an offensive player like mm. you can imagine if you score 60 game uh, 60 goals per season that's an average of 30 games a season that's two goals per game yeah you're contributing to 10 goals that's one sixth of the entire season that you've mm. contributed to Right, so that's a pretty decent. Yeah, that's a it's pretty decent. So, 
um, we, we did not score 60 goals. We probably scored around 40. So mm-hmm. I was responsible for about a quarter of the goals. Yeah. So, which was massive. Mm-hmm. And once again, uh, the club folded. Mm. So the club folded and I couldn't stay. And Hurricane Maria happened in Puerto Rico. This was in 2017, mm-hmm. where the island just got destroyed by the hurricane and everybody was forced to evacuate. So yeah. going back was almost not an option. Mm. So then I went to the USL to Richmond in 2018, mm-hmm. Richmond Kickers, and I got injured. I uh, tore my MCL and uh, partially tore my meniscus. Mm. And it was a six, no more. It was eight weeks that I had to stay out. But I, when I came back, I didn't recover fully. I just needed more time. So it was about closer to 12 weeks. Mm-hmm. So three months that I missed. When I came back, I was ineffectual. I wasn't really as effective. Mm-hmm. And I scored two goals that season in like probably 16 games or 15 mm-hmm. games. Mm-hmm. And it was another down, you know. So going up, 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 I went down. And uh, yeah, this was 2018. And then I, my final move was Hartford Athletic uh, expansion franchise uh, in 2019, which, to be fair, I actually really liked it there. I really did. Mm-hmm. I really liked it there a lot uh, in terms of off the field stuff and just like even like how on the field stuff were going, mm-hmm. even though that the results were really poor. Um, I really liked it there. I felt, I felt welcomed. And in May of 2019, uh, Basically, my career ended uh, mm. because I got um, a really, really bad concussion. Mm. So I collided head on head with a teammate in training mm. in May, and um, I didn't. Uh, I I didn't wait enough time to come back from from my head injury, which mm. I didn't know because mm. I wasn't aware of the concussion protocol and like I felt fine, like you know I had a headache or whatever, like it was like some minor symptoms, but mm. nothing extreme. So I come back the following week. Um, still in May and uh, I'm not even joking like it's not a joke I've never been hit in the face or in the head before by a ball never not once mm. and not once do I ever remember my career getting elbowed in the face mm. I remember getting slapped or getting mm. like you know like you know fended off of yep. by someone's yep. hand in yep. my face like that's normal it's contact sports but never did I ever receive an elbow or get a ball from five yards shot in my face Mm -hmm. ever in my life. Mm -hmm. What happened was that training that I came back from, it was like the second training after my injury, we were doing small sided games and this shot just blasted in my face from five yards. Like, I mean, rip into the face. And yeah, that was it. That was, that did me um, really bad. I had like really, really bad symptoms. Like they were terrible, mm-hmm. they were really bad. Mm-hmm. I was, I had like vertigo, which mm-hmm. vertigo for the young players who don't know what that is. Vertigo is basically when you're sitting still or laying still and things are moving around you. Um, just things are, it make you dizzy. Um, I was very sensitive to light, very sensitive to noise. So any type of noise, any type of lighting would really hurt my head. Yeah. I woke up for four months straight with a headache. I remember like wow, wow. clear as day. Wow. I woke up every single day from like the end of May until September or almost October until my birthday every day mm. with a headache. And my wish every single night when I went to sleep was I hope I don't wake up the next day with a headache yeah. and I'll wake up with a headache. And if I would wake up, if I would get up too fast from my bed, everything would move. Like wow. it was like too, like, like if I would wake up, if I would get up too fast, like, yeah. I would just, everything would like be like spinning. Mm. So my symptoms were really, really bad. And um, yeah, I I was just following these protocols that were advised to me and I couldn't jog. I couldn't get my heart rate up because it would just contribute to too much, too much to my brain. So yeah, like pretty much five months in, it started getting better. Mm. So like after the four months, after the headache started going away, Mm. I pretty quickly got better. Like after the headaches went away, the symptoms, the other symptoms were getting better. So I would get nauseous after training because I could just tell that like I was working really hard mm-hmm. and that my brain was still not fully mm-hmm. like ready. And I risked it. I really did. Like I 
got into some games. I never started anymore. Mm-hmm. I never I was done, but I got into some games. Mm-hmm. So I probably played another four games, like partial mm-hmm. games when I recovered and then the season ended. And of course I didn't my option to get picked up like mm-hmm. which was obvious, but uh, this was at the end of 2019. And this is where my let's say professional career ended. Mm-hmm. This is where it was was finished. But I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know it yet. Um, but yeah, just, you know, having after that, having time to reflect what happened, um, with my injury, Mm. I really took it upon myself to be like, Hey, look, like I need to be smart on what I want to do. Um, so when I go home to Switzerland to visit my family, I was seeking for opportunities like actively, like I wanted to continue Mm. to play, Mm. but nobody wanted me because, uh, yeah, I was injured. Like mm-hmm. all the time, mm-hmm. injury prone. I got a knee injury in heart in, in Richmond, and then I got a, a really bad concussion that nearly kept me out for six months at Hartford. And um, yeah, then I just was probably deemed or listed as a injury prone injury prone player. Yeah. And um, yeah, so my next move was really just being focused on finding a club that I could just, you know, kind of build myself back up. Mm. And that uh, opportunity never came. Um, So it was evident to me that things aren't looking so great professionally. So then Corona broke off, like a break broke out, Mm. Corona, like a COVID. Um, And then after COVID or during COVID, it became more and more evident to me that this is becoming more and more difficult. So I actually accepted a day job mm-hmm. after the summer mm-hmm. in 2020 when the COVID kind of calmed down. And that was my professional career. Yeah, in mm-hmm. a nutshell, like mm-hmm. pretty much summed up. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was quite heartbreaking yeah. you know, for me. It was a really bad experience, but, but there is a, um, there's an upside to this. Mm. There's a big upside to it. And um, yeah. I wouldn't be where I am today and doing what I'm doing yeah. with the people that I'm doing it with if that didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. And it took me a really long time to digest my so-called failed career in my eyes. Um, you know, I felt guilty mm-hmm. to myself. I felt guilty to my parents and to my family that like I didn't make it. You know, that I didn't make more out of myself. Mm. And then once I digested everything, and once everything became clear to me that, you know, it's over, and that I ended up moving forward in my life, things got better, you know. But mm. it was really, really, really hard. Yeah. Like it yeah. was bad. Yeah. Like yeah. I was like borderline depressed. Yeah. Like I'm not. I, this is just a quick summary. But yeah. it's just you know I, I was really down, really, yeah. really low. Yeah. Yeah. Very sad. Um. Very low. Yeah. And um. No sense of direction. You know, so I didn't know what to do. Well, dude, you know, I want to say thank you from myself and the audience for for, for sharing that, sharing the whole story. And it's the exact reason I have this podcast, man. You know, everyone sees, you know, the shiny stuff on Instagram, being a pro and the stuff like that. And, you know, obviously we talked about your career. Yeah. You know, you had up, 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 up. And then you had some downs, you Absolutely. know, and, and, you know, I think that's why I love podcasting, especially this in-person one for the first time. It's like a, it's like a, you know, psychology session. You get things off your chest. We yeah. chop things up. And I think the moral of the story is, you know, there's always going to be bad times. You know, there's always going to be tough times, but yeah. the goal is how do you react to those tough times, to those stresses, to those obstacles. That's right, yeah. And, you know, from my standpoint, I mean, dude, you know, you're one of the most well-spoken guys I know. You know, I you're genuine. That. Thank you. Um, and, and you want people to succeed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. I appreciate that. Yeah, man. And I, I only tell the truth. You know, I, I saw it, you know, right away. You know, you you want to help push players on. Mm-hmm. You know, not like a typical agent that, that you know, a lot of people know of. Um, and, you know, that, that's why you and Dennis are, are different. You know, you mm-hmm. really want to contribute to a player's development. And like I said from the beginning, you know, I, I wish I had a mentor like myself. Yeah. Now players have a mentor like you. Um, yeah. Since since 
you went through what you went through and yeah. for, from my eyes it's not a failed career at all you know what I mean I, I think you know you, you went to many different places and you know you did what you could I mean you know yeah. you pulled out due to medical reasons and yeah. one thing that I also want to share that I really respect you for and I told my stepdad as well when we met you last time is I could see you're a real family man you know what I mean you really care about your daughter yeah uh, you care about your family, and, and, and for me, that's massive. You know yeah. what I mean? And I remember we spoke about this on the phone when we first met, and you said that you could risk it again and go back. Sure. But you're trying to start a family. You have a daughter now. That's right. And, you know, that's why you've gotten into what you've gotten into. That's and, right. And yeah. uh, I think, you know, everything happens for a reason. And, and like we said before, I think you, you have, um, you know, as, as much, you know, you just you need to be proud of yourself. You know what I mean. Yeah. For what what you've done and yeah. for the choices you made. You yeah. know what I mean. So. Well, I appreciate that, yeah. yeah, man. With that being said, you know I want to give you a gift for coming on the podcast. Oh, first, no. uh, <laughs> first podcast, first live podcast. Oh man. Open it on camera, my brother. Uh, yeah. Uh, it is an honor. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me. Yep. Oh. <laughs> uh, Give it a smell. This is, uh, Organic, bro. This is, uh, yeah, this is incredible. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. This is incredible. Yeah. Can't believe that. Yeah, take this take is, a look at the uh, next one, though, my man. This is this is the this is the Rick Fit way. All right. This is check uh, out the next thing we got in here, buddy. Uh, thank you so much, man. Yeah. That's. And yes, I sir. even got the tool to make it, I mean, bro. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Man. Thank you so much. Bro. Yeah. I really appreciate yeah, it. Well, for, sure. for people who know me well, I know obviously the audience. You guys, you guys don't know me so well, but um, or at all. But uh, I love black coffee, and um, I mean this is just an amazing gift. Um, and and um, you know I think this this speaks to Rick's character as well that I was speaking and touching up on from before. Uh, very very attentive to detail. So, you know, that's, that's just something that you receive or that you build up on with, with, with time. Like, you know, it's um, a characteristic that you hone in and, and that, that, you know, you don't have to buy expensive gifts to make someone happy. You know, you don't need to gift someone a Rolex or you don't need to gift someone a ju like jewelry or like a car or something. You can literally just pay attention to them as a person and know what they like and combined is probably I, I don't even want to put a price tag on it but if this cost you 25 bucks this would have made me a lot more happy than if you would have bought me something that I'm just going to put in my closet or in yeah. my drawer yeah. because this is actually something that I use to my day to day yeah. and I really appreciate that and you know it's you know this, these, are, these are the kinds of things man it's just so cool it's like I just want to explain to you guys in the audience that like like despite having said everything I said about my career and how I how I how I believed at the time it was a failure. I'm gonna to get to the next part. This is what it led to, you know. Yeah. Like this is what my career ended up being, and this is what it led to. And 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 you know, this is worth more than having a stellar career because the higher you climb the ladder, the more people want to cling on to you, and more likely than not, not always, more likely than not for the wrong reasons. You know, it makes it all the better that when you when you meet real people that want to support you and want to help you along your way, you know, it's, um, it's more valuable than having a stellar career. It really is because, um, you know, fame and, and like all of these, like, you know, stellar footballers and stuff like that, like they're very popular for the moment and for what they can provide, what value they could provide for people mm -hmm. in that moment. But then you can really tell when, when their prime is gone, how people start retracting. Right. And for them, I can't, I can't speak for them, but I'm just mm. hypothesizing, hypothesizing and mm. thinking that the only people that are really going to matter in the end are their, is their family. And that's why how you touched up on it before is that I'm, I'm, I'm very big into my family is because they, were, they literally were not only just there for me when it was good, they were there for me when it was bad. But like when I ended my career... You know they supported me mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. they were they were supportive of you know my endeavors they were supportive of you know understanding of my 
let's say I would call it confusion or I guess let's say lack of awareness of what I wanted mm. to do next mm. um, so when I, yeah I, I ended up um, so here, here comes here comes the good part so um, yeah the, how I initially started the podcast was yeah kind of explaining how I met my business partner and how we, we ended up uh, linking up and, and starting our agency so yeah so I was a uh, in 2020 uh, at the end of the year, uh, so um, October, October in 2020, I found out I was going to be a father. And um, yeah, so I, uh, that, that really was, it, it, see, it's like, I, I don't want to be corny. Like, I, no. I, I don't like being corny. I don't like saying like these general things things and statements or whatever but like that really changed my life in the way that how I was thinking like mm. I was I was being a boy I was being a child sulking complaining crying whining like I said like I was a very emotional it was a very emotional time very depressing time for me and I was I was being held captive by my own state of being mm. I wasn't allowing myself to basically see any progress beyond my failed career mm -hmm. like I was holding that against myself mm -hmm. and the process of digesting the failure for me the, truly that's how I feel like you you described it as I should be proud of but at the time being I saw it as a massive failure mm -hmm. that I failed I didn't reach those goals that I had set for myself like for example participating in a in a na international tournament with the national team mm -hmm. with, with switzerland with mm -hmm. the united states or even potentially italy if i did that well um or you know scoring multiple goals in first divisions and first tiers like in mls and switzerland or in bigger leagues mm -hmm. so therefore because i never reached anything close to that I, s I saw it as a massive failure because I believed so heavily in myself that that I could attain that. And I still today do believe that mm. if things would have gone right for me, I think I had the qualities and I had the ability to become mm. a top, top pro. But it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't pan out. But back to what I was saying was that um, it, w it was a hard time for me to digest mm -hmm. everything. And... Yeah, when I found out that I was going to be a father, literally, I changed. Like, I changed. My, my brain changed. Mm -hmm. Like, my way of thinking changed. Because I went from being selfish to only thinking about myself and only thinking about how sad I was to shifting the idea or for shifting the mentality to believing that this baby or this child needs me. This child needs me. Yep. Yeah. And that shift, like I went from being a boy to a man when I was 28. And I say this, I said, I told this to my parents, I told this to my family. They know that like, I became a man when, when I found out that I was going to be a father. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, I think that, um, yeah, that, that bond that I grew up with, with my family, I wanted that same bond with, with my daughter yeah. and I wanted to pass that along. So. I really need to get myself in check. I need to get myself straightened out. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's why, um, that's why I changed. Mm. My daughter is a huge influence on my life, like mm. really, and 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 she is a blessing from God to me, mm. um, because she was the messenger in my life at the time being that I needed to change. Mm. And when she was born, that's really when. I felt the responsibility and the yeah. change. Like that's when it was became real. Like you know, obviously, during the pregnancies, mm. it's the concept of being a father. But when she was here, you're like in awe. It's like it, the moment is here. I need to. I'm responsible for this person. Yeah. And I changed. Mm. Com completely changed. I never looked back. Wow. Never looked back. Yeah. And that was the moment, or leading up to a little few months before that, led up to starting my own business. And um, I really took it upon myself and said, I'm going to do a day job. That's fine. But I'm going to start my own business. Mm. And I want to I wanna be in my own boss. I want to do... And, and, and more importantly, just being my own boss. I want to help people. I want to be... I want to I change an industry where 
there's a lot of corruption where there's a lot of you know negative connotation or ne- negative stereotypes to mm-hmm, mm-hmm. being an agent or whatever i want to change that i don't want to be a, a force for the good versus a force for for the bad mm-hmm. so that's how we started off and um, this was in 2021 so this all happened at the same time so mm-hmm. my daughter was born in may mm-hmm. and we officially launched and went to market uh in june wow. june 1st wow. so it all happened within a week yeah, yeah, yeah. so honestly for me really like um you know i'm a believer I'm of the Christian faith, and I believe that that was a sign of God, you know, that this is meant for me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I, I never look back. Yeah, it's, it's all. It's, 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 like, it's like my depression was healed. Like, the, it's not like I was, like, actually clinically depressed. Yeah, I was in a de- I was in a <laughs> depressed state for yeah. over a year. Like, yeah. it was bad. Yeah. And... I saw no way out. I saw no hope for my future because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm. But my purpose of my life arrived at 28. Mm. My purpose of being a father and a purpose of being a force for the good for players that were as so naive like I was when I was a player. Yeah. Because yeah. I was naive. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know the ins yeah, and outs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know the I didn't know the contracts. I didn't know the agreements. So Trust me, I get it. I already know what you're saying yourself. Here we go, another guy in his sports jacket with a nice watch, with a chain, trying to sell me on his ebook, trying to sell me on his course. But no, that's not me. You know me. I've posted thousands of pieces of free content across all social media, six thousand to almost be exact, and I've spent thousands of dollars to do that for you to help you for free. Now I'm launching the Rick Fit Academy app. I put 24 years of my effort playing a beautiful game into this app for you to help you become the best footballer possible. And it's not gonna cost you anything up front. You can get a seven day free trial, try out the app, and if you don't like the app, you cancel and then we'll never speak again. But I'm really sure that you'll love this app. I look forward to seeing you within the tribe. Have a fantastic one. My mission, which actually truly came from my business partner because he's a really good guy. Sure Dennis is, yeah. is top, top, top. I mean, he's my big brother. Yeah. Like, seriously. Like, I mean, look, he's he's African-American descent or whatever, but he's my, he's my brother. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. It's, yeah. I'm a white guy. He's a black guy. Yeah. Uh, he's my brother. Like, you know, that's, that's my guy. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I have so much to thank him for believing in me. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, because I was a wreck, man. Yeah. Yeah, I was a wreck. I was bad, bad, bad. Yeah. And he believed in me, mm. you know, and that was, um, that's why I think belief yeah. is so important. Like faith is see, like believing it without seeing it. So mm. like, like you don't need the evidence mm. to believe in mm. it. So that's the faith. Yeah. But then believing is, you know, Obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a synonym of faith, but believing is you believe that it will come, you know, like in your future. It's planned for you, like you know, it's 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 mm. destined in your future, and that's the belief. So obviously, the faith is you don't need to see it; yeah, yeah. it will, like you know, it it, yeah. it can occur, it yeah. will happen, or whatever. But like the belief is it that you're gonna make it happen down the road. Yes, that's yes. the, the yes. Pl- application to the faith, mm-hmm. and. Dennis fed me with so much belief. He made so many things clear to me that I didn't see. And I vented so often to him. Like, you know, we went through so much, like, building, like, through personality. And Mm -hmm. he just helped me filter out what I need to get rid of. Love that. And that's why I'm so grateful to him. Like, I I owe him so much. You know, he gave me this platform to help these players and he gave me the confidence in myself that I can do whatever that I can mm. that mm. he made me believe that I can do this because mm. I wouldn't have never done this alone. Mm. I would have never done it alone because if I said I would have started my own company as an agent by myself, I probably would have failed because mm. I would have thought that was too hard, this is too difficult, mm. oh, a barrier to entry, this and that or whatever. I would have made up a million excuses. Mm-hmm. But because he was keeping me accountable, I was keeping him accountable. We were moving forward together. And he had a lot of good strengths that yeah. I didn't possess, and yeah. I have a lot of good strengths that he doesn't possess, and that's mm-hmm. why we were so perfect mm-hmm. in that in that dynamic. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, man, it, it was truly yeah 
I have no doubt that this is yeah. what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. And this, I have yeah. no doubt, even after having believed that my fail, my career was a failure, that was my destiny, man. Mm. That was what I, in, in, in retrospect, now, two mm. years, two and a half years down the line, after having gone through the entire process of digesting that very difficult time for me, yeah. I've accepted it. Yeah. And yeah. the acceptance makes me thrive now because I needed that experience to apply the things I want to change today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to change that I'm going to protect my players from any type of contractual clauses. Mm -hmm. We read the clauses. These things need to be guaranteed, mm -hmm. and I need to guarantee my player that he's safe in these regards. Of course. In terms of finances, in terms of length of contract, in terms of housing, mm -hmm. in terms of bonus structure, in terms of you know other extracurricular things that the player could be compensated mm -hmm. for like you know for appearances and stuff like that like you know so just really need to be clear uh and upfront with the players and i yeah. think that's what differentiates i guess maybe the most agents slash i guess represent re representatives from dennis and i is that we do everything together we talk about every single player together and we have a relationship with all of our players and we maintain our relationship with our players. We, yeah. we stay in touch with the player throughout the whole season. Yeah. We're not the type of agency that we're going to talk to you when your deal is up and we need to renegotiate or we need to find you a new club. We're, we're there through the game to game, week to week, up and down, good performance, poor performance. That's the agent that we are because we want to be a support system for our players. Yeah. And we understand that when we were players, sometimes we lacked that support system. And it's like you said, you said it yourself, you, yeah. you were trying to change the industry or I guess try to get into your line of work to make a difference because you want to be that mentor, that brother, that, that figure in your life that you didn't have. Yep. And we're trying to do the same. Yep. We're trying to be the agent that we needed or wanted in the diff most difficult time of our careers. Yep. Because when things are good, I mean, nobody, nobody easy, needs it. Yeah, nobody, easy. nobody yeah. needs extra motivation. Yeah. Nobody yeah. needs confidence because it's already there. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's a, it's a byproduct of your good situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because then you feel confident you're going to get a better contract in the future. Mm -hmm. You feel confident that you're progressing, you know, you feel well respected and the scary times are when things are going bad exactly. and you don't know you're, you feel insecure about the next year because my contract was running out in the end of the year. Mm. If I'm not starting, if I'm not performing, if I'm not putting up numbers, am I going to get a club next year? Mm. Am I going to be just kind of, you know, kicked to the curb? Are they going to pick up my option? Or are they going to try to negotiate me down? Like, you know, a lot of doubt creeps into players' minds when mm. things aren't going well. Mm. So our concept and basically what Dennis and I do is we just really want to be there for our players. Yes. We yeah. want to be there. Wanna... And, and, I, and I think for me, the most important thing, you know, contracts, housing, all this stuff, the most important thing is emo emotionally, mm -hmm. being emotionally there for your players. Yeah. Uh, like you said, when the down times come. Yeah. You know, for me, actually, one of the most passionate things that I have, you know, when, when coaching players and helping people online is the emotions, you yeah. know, because, you know, like I said, we're very grateful for you being vulnerable and open and sharing, sure. you know, the highs and lows and the roller coaster that football is. Exactly. And what it can lead to. Yeah. You know, people think, oh, yeah, wow, Giuseppe's got, you know, 40,000 followers on Instagram or he played pro this many years. He, he must be doing great. Yeah. But they don't realize. No. Yeah, yeah, you know, sure. you, you, you felt like a failure to yourself. Sure, absolutely. And I want to let the people out there alone know because I actually get tons of questions now about depression and, and mental sure. states and all that. And I want to clarify that because I think it's very, very important. And I think everyone says, oh, yeah. You know, um, we need to have more support mentally in football, but no one takes action. Right. So that's what I'm trying to do in a small way through these podcasts or the stuff that I put out. Yeah. At the end of the day, you are not alone. No. You, no matter who you are, no matter how much money you have, no matter how famous you are, everyone is a human. We go through highs and lows. We're not robots. You're not always on. You're not always going to have a great day. Yeah. But what you can do and what we've spoken about Many times you control what you can control and you do what you can. It's okay to accept the emotions. Don't deflect them or deny them. Sure. But for me, I think the most important thing is to really have a support system, have a buddy or, or whoever it is that you can talk to and be completely honest with. And, it, and it's also another message for, for you people to always reach out to the people you care about. Yeah. Ask sure. them how are they doing. For sure. 
you know, it might look good on the outside, but you don't know how they're doing on the inside. Yeah. So really having that support system is huge. And then also another big thing is you can tell who your true friends are if they're with you from the bottom. Yeah. You know, like Giuseppe was saying, you get to be a pro and then people come. No, you remember the people who have always been with you. Mm -hmm. So with, with all that being said, I think it's very important to tune into your emotional state. Don't feel like you're too soft to share your emotions with someone. But then you can also get to the spe spectrum. You know, obviously Andrew Tate has gotten really big and he talks about that depression isn't real. I'm not going to share my thoughts on that. But basically what he's trying to say, and I completely understand him, is your goal should be to, and I'm not saying I support everything he's, he, he right. does and his actions. I think he says some good things. I think maybe some of the things he says are out of line. Sure. But one thing he, you know, one thing I do believe in is what he says is do your best to be the highest value man possible every single day and look at every day as a battle. You know what I mean? Don't let these emotions eat you alive. And if you just keep moving forward, good things are going to happen. And like Giuseppe said, when he had another human life to take care of, he pushed everything to the side. He said, I'm done with these emotions. I'm not sulking anymore. Mm -hmm. He took everything into his own hands and he's at where he's at. Yeah. So. yeah, and then also to clarify your point, like it, it's it's hard, you know. Like I'll speak directly to the camera. It's um, it's it, when you're going through a hard time, just know, like Rick said, you're not the only person. You should reach out to your to your family. If you don't have family, you should reach out to your friends. If you don't have friends, you should reach out to your teammates. If you don't have teammates, you reach out to your coaches. If you don't have coaches, you should reach out to your teacher. You always the the point is you should. You, you have always someone to reach out to and really try to understand where you are and, and, and how you feel, but don't let that feeling overtake you. Like, don't let it overtake you. Acknowledge what's going on and really try to understand, but don't let it possess you because that, that's not going to help you move forward what it what identifying how you feel what is that what that's going to do is is going to help you find the cure that's what it's going to help so by you identifying that you know your girlfriend left you is making you sad or you know you're you you got a pretty big injury uh that's making you sad or you failed the test or you didn't get into your favorite school or for college or you didn't make your first trial for a pro contract or something Regardless of what, how big or how small that obstacle is to you, don't let it consume you. Because like I mentioned before, you're going to get a lot more no's than yeses, and you're going to have a lot more obstacles in your life than, than, than good things. So really don't let these negative times overtake your life because there's always a way out. And mm -hmm. even though I'm, I said like before that for me, things are getting a lot better, I still struggle. I still have... Today in my daily life, I still have struggles that I want to do better for myself. I want to do better for my daughter. And that's just me not being complacent and letting myself go. I'm keeping myself in check every day. But who helps me a lot along the way to my day to day is my business partner, which is also my accountability partner. Because if I don't get something done, even though I maybe don't feel like doing it, he makes sure I do it. And when you, when you, do something when you don't feel like doing it, you feel accomplished. You're like, oh, wow, well, I'm glad I, I'm glad I did it even when I didn't feel like doing it. Yeah. And yeah, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's about that. really, like, like I said, like the corny stuff again, like it's just really about never giving up. Don't give into your situation. Mm -hmm. There's always a solution. And there's most definitely always a person that you can rely on and speak to mm -hmm. about an issue. And yeah, like don't, act too hard or don't act like if it's not normal for you as a guy to go through negative emotions. Mm -hmm. That's completely normal. Mm -hmm. Men feel like failures all the time. Men feel depressed all the time. And also to clarify that, I do think that you have more control over that than, than, exactly. than what you think. Like mm -hmm. you really do like, mm -hmm. and Find a purpose, like you need to find your purpose in life. And once you've found it, and that's a, that's a very simple thing for me to say, right? Like, oh, hey, like find your purpose. But yeah. that's what you need to do. Like you need to find your purpose. And when you find it, you need to write it. And you need to really 
perfect it and keep growing and consistently be persistent so that you can obviously make that purpose a beneficial and positive force in the in, in the world essentially your purpose should always be to be a positive in someone's life a net positive but you the, the purpose is the application on how you're going to do it mm. and the how for me is helping these players mm. achieve dreams maybe if they're fallen short to their dreams pick them back up and find another path for them mm -hmm. you know just mm -hmm. like i did like maybe i maybe there's a player in my future that is going to go so, through something very similar to me mm -hmm. and i know what i need to do in order to help them mm -hmm. and i think that's very valuable for me yeah no i, I love that and i, I want to tell you know first i want to clarify i fully believe emotions are temporary they're not permanent they're like a wave yeah. you know so I, you know, I want to share a quick personal story. When I was in Sweden, when I was 23, I actually went through what I thought was depression. Mm -hmm. That's what I really dove into s the spiritual side of life. Mm -hmm. You know, I, was, I had a pretty d decent time in Germany for three years. I, I never told this story, so it's going to be new to all of you. And um, I went into Sweden. I was on trial with four teams and three of the teams wanted to sign me. Uh, one of the teams didn't want to sign me, and my agent you know, called me, he's like, you know, these three clubs want to sign you, which club you want to sign for? And um, you know, I told them I want to sign for the club, which is knee shopping, the one I signed for. And I remember I went into the coach's office, uh, I had just played a friendly, I was on trial with them for a week, I did really well during training, did well in the friendly. There were like eight other guys on trial, they pulled me into the office and they were like, Friedlander, well done today. We saved the best for last. You know, just telling me they wanted to sign me for the next season. They told me they wanted me to start as the starting right back. This was in the winter. I think it was November. The season was coming back around in February. So I left the office very high. I said, you know, I want to sign for this team. You know, got everything sorted out, signed for the team. I came back in February uh, to the club and everything changed. Everything changed like... I was like, you know, they really respected me and praised me and wanted me to be the starter. And all of a sudden, I just felt like a, like, uh, you know, the 22nd man on the roster. No one cared about me. I wasn't getting the chances, you know. And um, it was a very tough time for me. You know, that, that was probably the most adversity I had gone through, you know, as a player. Uh, it was very tough mentally. And, uh, you know, went through that season, didn't get a lot of appearance, appearances, maybe 10, you know, or something out of like, you know, 28 games. And, uh, you know, guys were constantly pushing for me. You know, one of the guys that always pushed for me and always believed in me, you know, always had my back was Andrew Jean-Baptiste. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, top player. He always spoke to the coach, why aren't you giving Freelander a chance, whatever. I actually played against him in college. Yeah. Played against him at UConn. The machine. In stores. and. Yeah. He's your buddy, huh? Yeah, 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 one of my best buddies. Well, you can tell him, I, I was the one that knocked him out of the tournament. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we were playing yeah, in yeah, UConn, yeah. and we yeah. got scored in the 88th minute, yeah. or no, in the 83rd. Yeah. And five minutes later, I scored in the 88th equalizer, yeah, and we yeah. go into overtime, and then we knock him out to, to go to the final four. Yeah. And uh, yeah, John Baptiste was on that team, yeah, UConn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Machine, yeah. machine. Yes. So with that being said, you know, came back after the season and I had never experienced such a low. I was like in my, you know, I was in my parents place. I didn't have my own place, you know, just living in Europe. I was there for like three weeks in the dark, hood on. My, my parents never saw me like that in my life. They're like, Eric, what's going on? I was mm -hmm. like, I don't know. Like, I've never felt like this, whatever. So whatever, like I ended up going to like a physician or something like for a checkup and, and he asked me, you know, how I was mentally. I told him I was a little down, you know, and I've never, I've never taken medication. Um, you know, I've never done any drugs, just drink here and there. Uh, was, I've always, you know, as you guys know, I'm a holistic guy, not into any of the pharmaceutical crap. And he all, he, he tried to get me to get into Xanax, you know, the anxiety medication and, and, and. I said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not taking that. He didn't. And this is why I'm so passionate about health mm -hmm. and about especially men's health, you know, mm -hmm. and mental health right. and, and finding hope for, for young men and obviously young women as well. But I could relate to the man more. Right. And I said, no, I don't need that. He didn't even ask me about my sleep. He didn't ask me about my nutrition. He didn't ask me about supplements. Didn't ask me about training right away. Just wanted to give me a freaking pill pharmaceutical. Yeah. I said, no, I'm not taking that. He's like, 
then you're gonna go down a dark, uh, a bad spiral, a dark uh, road. Wow. And after that, I, you know, obviously I have lows, but I don't react. But that's another thing where I prove that person wrong. Yeah. I don't need, and I never, I've never taken a pharmaceutical in my life. Yeah. I never will, because I do it holistically. You know, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to share that because I think it's it's very important to key on, key in on that. And, and Giuseppe's been you know vulnerable and, and and everything off of his chest. So want to let you guys know that as well. Yeah, no, and, you know, I think that creates a lot of value also for your followers because um, I think that like you know when they see your presence, they see you as a very confident guy, someone that's very confident and and you know obviously has perfected his craft. Yeah, but they also should know that you know. Even people like yourself, you know, you go through it, you know, you yeah. go through negative times, you go through difficult times, but you know, like, like we've said from the beginning, it's just, it's not a reason to stop. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, it's just never find a reason to stop. So yeah, no, and that's, that's a, that's a good story because you know, like it's, you, you actually hit the nail on the head with people from the outside always think that, you know, everything's going great and they just don't know the details of people's lives and how, how they're feeling and how they're going or, mm -hmm. or how they're doing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's really important to just really toughen yourself up. It's exactly. so important to really train yourself. Like, mm. you, need, you need to invest in yourself. Yeah. You really do. Like, mm -hmm. And these difficult times, these difficult times prepare you for that. Yep. And like, you know, like I said before, like I'm, I, I, I practice Christianity, like I'm a Christian. And, you know, when you pray and you ask for a certain situation, I believe that God doesn't give you the, the strength. Like, for example, if you pray for, if I pray for patience, mm. like I pray to be patient, like God is not going to make me more patient. He's going to put me in a situation that's going to require me to be patient, mm. which is going to train me to try and be patient, mm. you know, put me in that setting or in that mm. environment. So, you know, there's also a story that's like kind of like, you know, there's a there's a person that went went on a boat and, and the boat's crashing, and puts on a life vest and then you know jump and obviously jumps in the water boat sinks and then starts praying oh God please send someone to save me, or if it's just God save me sorry God mm -hmm, save mm -hmm, me, mm -hmm. and then uh, one boat comes by and then. Um, you know, say, so, hey, I'm going to help you. And he's like, no, 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 don't worry. God is saving me. And then the boat goes. And then the second boat comes. There's another guy that comes, a second boat. I says, hey, uh, you know, uh, how do you need help? He's like, no, 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 God will save me. Mm. And then in the end, he drowns and he passes away. And then, and then, um, wow. and this is not a real story, by the way. <laughs> it's a metaphor. Yeah. And when the person meets God in front of the gates of heaven, he's like, God, why didn't you save me? And then he said, I sent you two people. I love that. That's and awesome. you know, it's it's about it's about identifying what you want and identifying how it's going to come in your life. Like it's not going to manifest directly like the way you want it. And that is most definitely something that needs to be said is mm. that life is not fair. Life is not fair. Like life doesn't happen on your terms. Exactly. You live life and then you have to adjust into the current situation and try to make the best out of it. And try to get your way mm -hmm. in an ethical way, mm -hmm. not through manipulation. Mm -hmm. But you need to fight through whatever situation you're in and try to make the best out of it to get what you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Life is not fair. Yep. So. And that's, that's what you've demonstrated. You know, that's what football demonstrates. You demonstrated oh, through your story. We've all had that, that journey. And, you know, just, just to, you know. Um, seal this topic up I really love what you said there um, about that's why we train and I think you know for me what I try to even, even I've had clients before who've been depressed and mm -hmm. who've been you know close to taking their own life and, 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 and you know as a trainer I was taught in school like that's not your scope of practice like you know okay. send them to a psychologist or something, sure. something like that but sure. you know I just can't do that you know, I'm, I'm the type of man where I want to help them. And it's about build, building that, that shield, you know, and you build that shield through the right habits. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, life is not fair. Things are constantly come your way. Yeah. But the way you defend yourself is you build that shield through proper training, proper nutrition, proper sleep, proper recovery. Yeah. 
And when you constantly work on yourself each day and better yourself, you're going to better that shield. For sure. You know, and um, yeah, I mean, that's just a, another reason to take care of yourself, you know, and, and, and when you take care of yourself and you do all those right things, that's, that's like what we talk, touched about this whole conversation, belief. But when you take care of yourself, you show yourself that you respect yourself. Yeah. And when you respect yourself, that belief is going to come. Sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's some good value as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think that in the end, I feel like if we would have to sum up this whole entire podcast, it would be to give as much value as possible to young audiences, aspiring players, aspiring professionals, aspiring college players, mm. even current pros mm. um, that are maybe going through a difficult time. It's just to add value. And I think that you guys are really uh, lucky that you guys get to have a person like Rick. Um, I think that social media um, can be very toxic, it can be, but then also there it could be very helpful. And I think that if you're on, you know, following, I'd say whatever helps you in your career with Rick, I think that it could be very beneficial because he's an uplifting person, he's a positive person and with genuine intentions. You know, there's no BS really behind it that he's profiting in any way. He's just giving the facts and you know, I think that that's just kind of what needs to be done more in not just our industry, just in life in general. It's just don't try to calm people, don't try to, you know, make a quick buck or like, you know, flip a brick. Be honest with each other, give positive and valuable information along the way. And that comes, like we already stated at the beginning, it's just through your character. And that's why successful people are always the ones that really want to help each other out. They're always lending a hand because they know that by adding that positive value to that person, that they've helped them in their next step, they needed that in their past. They needed that. They know that they know where they're at in their path. And they know that they just maybe might need this one hand, this one step, this one extra push to excel. So, you know, just try to be as positive as possible with one another and try to be positive and especially be positive with yourself. Just be positive with yourself, like, like Rick said. Be proud of yourself, like regardless of what stage in life you are. And become as competent as possible and become as, become as accountable as possible about your situation mm. don't give away your power don't give away don't give away don't give your power away to someone else because mm. if you're giving them the power over you and dominion over you they can influence you mm. don't let that don't let that happen because yeah. i know that i let that happen to me yeah. Yeah, we only have a finite amount of energy. Yeah. You know, you can't give away that precious energy. Yeah, and like, for example, how I specifically would apply that is just, I would not allow, I would not allow my career to define my future. So I'm going to put my career aside, mm -hmm. and I'm going to take the valuable lessons out of it and extract it, and then apply it to my new career path. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to allow my past determine my future mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. what i mean i'm not giving dominion or power i'm taking the power away from my past and i'm empowering my future by enabling an account and, and being accountable for my future mm -hmm. because you can't change the past anymore that's history that's done exactly. and i cannot rewrite it mm -hmm. but what i can do is extract and apply for my future mm -hmm. so that's where the power lies mm -hmm. is looking back and correcting the mistakes for your future yeah yeah so yeah. dude i love it you know uh, i think we can end off on that i think it's been a fantastic conversation yeah. i really enjoyed it thanks yeah uh, likewise yeah i mean like i said you know to uh miliano you know you were probably the best guest to have uh, on the first uh in-person podcast i appreciate You're a good that. speaker genuine guy and uh, I think me and you, we get along because we have a lot of similarities. We want to help each other and we want to help other players and, and, and people. That's right. So, man, uh, this is just the beginning of, of our collaboration. And yeah. uh, Thank you. I look forward to uh, really cementing this relationship. Sure. Uh, if, if they want to follow you, maybe reach out, ask you questions. Where's the best place to reach you? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty active on all social media platforms. So um, my Instagram handle, Twitter handle, and Facebook handle, yeah. Uh, is at juicy ninety two, but how you spell it is G I U S S I nine two. Um, yeah, that's uh, it's my nickname, 
and that's um, something that I've been going by. For people who know me, that's kind of my nickname. But mm. yeah, no, I really appreciate you as well. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for being here. And uh, yeah, man, it's a, it's a start to or a continuation of something great, man. For sure. Just for sure. Want to be positive and help people move forward in the right direction. Awesome, brother. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you guys for listening. Make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you hit that subscribe. And we'll see you in the next Potter. Deuces. See you guys. Thank you. Thanks, bro. My guy. That was a great one. Yeah, bro. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Bro. Thank you. Let's get a good meal, boys. We deserve it. We're ready. All right. And that's it. After a good pod, yes, sir. we got a good meal. You enjoyed the pod, brother? Bro, it was amazing. Great value for everyone. It was a great experience. Honored to be the first uh, person to be on the podcast. Legend. Thanks, bro.